Okay, you're all set. Good morning and welcome to the Joint Standing Committee on Energy Utilities and Technology. My name is Seth Berry, I'm the House Chair and I'll be chairing the first of our public hearings today. Uh, Senator Vitelli, I believe will be taking over for the second hearing since that's my bill. Uh, the first bill up will be uh, from Senator Breen and after our public hearings, we have other business to attend to. So looking forward to all of that. Um, just a reminder that at public hearings, uh, we do uh, bring you in to the, the panelist screen and you are live and uh, being streamed for all the world to see on YouTube and um, through our uh, legislative, legislative website audio channel as well. Uh, when you are an attendee and you can only see us but not see yourself, uh, we ask that you refrain from using the chat since that is not part of the public record. And speaking of the public record, we always encourage written testimony. It is very helpful in establishing legislative intent later on. Uh, so if you um, haven't written your testimony and uh, you, uh, you, you plan to do so, we will thank you. And especially Representative Grahowski will thank you. Um, I will um, go next to committee introductions and we'll start with uh, Senator Vitelli. Good morning, everyone. My name is Eloise Vitelli. I represent Senate District 23, which is all of Saginaw County in the town of Dresden in Lincoln County. Great. Uh, Senator Stewart. Hey, good morning, folks. I'm Trey Stewart, State Senator in District 2, which is 51 communities in Aroostook and Penobscot counties, and I reside in Presque Isle. Great. Representative Wadsworth. Good morning, everybody. Nate Wadsworth. I represent House District 70, the towns of Hiram, Porter, Brownfield, Freiburg, and Lovell. Uh, Representative Kessler. Good morning. My name is Chris Kessler. I represent uh, part of South Portland, uh, which is also home of the uh, state champion class AA basketball team. Woo, woo. Uh, also that. representing part of Cape Elizabeth. A smidgen, I believe. Uh, Representative Cuddy. Good morning. My name is Scott Cuddy. I represent House District 98, which is Winterport, Frankfort, Searsport, and Swanville, and I live in Winterport. Great. Uh, Representative Sachs. Good morning, everyone. My name is Melanie Sachs. I'm proud to represent House District 48, which is Freeport and a part of panel. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Carlo. Good morning. I'm Nathan Carlo, state representative for House District 16, which includes part of my hometown of Buxton, Hollis, and part of Saco in the state legislature. And, and Representative Ziegler. Yes, good morning. I'm a Representative Paige Ziegler from District 96 in Waldo County. There are seven towns of Belmont, Liberty, Lincolnville, Montreux, Moore, Palermo, and Sears. And Representative Foster. Good morning. I'm Steve Foster representing District 104, which includes the towns of Charleston, Stetson, Exeter, Garland, and Dexter. Fantastic. And as always, we have with us our ABLE committee clerk, Jason Ellerding, and our committee uh, analyst, Lindsay Laxon, and uh, Representative Krahowski. I apologize. You're next. <laughs> Thank you. Last but not least, I hope Representative Nicole Grahowski serving the citizens of Ellsworth and Trenton and home, Ellsworth is home of Class B North men's basketball champions or boys basketball, I guess. Um, we are proud, proud of them this year. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations to all the, the winners. Um, they are all winners in our book. And uh, I am uh, Representative Seth Berry. Uh, my district is 55, House District 55, which is Bowdoin, Bowdenham, most of Richmond and uh, Swan Island, also known as the unorganized territory of Perkins Township, one of the first, one of the few unorganized territories in CD1. Uh, we are, as I said, going to hear a couple of bills today, and we will begin by bringing in uh, the sponsor of the first. Senator Kathy Breen to present her bill. And then as always, we'll be taking testimony in favor, in opposition, 
And finally, neither for nor against. And Jason, if you could bring in the sponsor, that would be great. I trust she's here. I, I'm I'm sorry, I'm not. We're not seeing her. I'm not seeing her. Okay. Just give it a moment. Do you see if she has been sent the uh, link? I, I can check. Okay. And while Jason is doing that, this seems like a good time to remind folks that uh, this is not how we've always operated. <clears throat> um, we are, uh, most of us still habituated to the committee room and to working together in person around Horseshoe. Looking forward to seeing everyone in person tomorrow at the State House when we are back in session. But the use of Zoom to hold committee hearings and work sessions is only is less than two years old and still working out some kicks from time to time. So our committee analyst has uh, helpfully suggested that there is a fiscal note review, which won't take long and which we could do in the interim just while we're waiting for the sponsor. So uh, Lindsay, why don't you um, bring up the fiscal note for LD 1814 before we open the public hearing? Excellent, thank you. Um, so this, I will share my screen momentarily. This is LD 1814. Um, an act to repeal the St. Francis Water District Charter and direct the town of St. Francis to assume, maintain, and operate the property of the district. I will share my screen. Okay, and please let me know if you can see my screen. Yes. Excellent. Um, so we heard back from OFPR and there is a fiscal note associated with this bill. It is a minor cost increase to other special revenue funds. Um, any additional costs to the PUC as a result of actions taken to approve of the sale and transfer of the St. Francis Water District to the town of St. Francis are anticipated to be minor and can be absorbed within existing budgeted resources. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Does the committee have any questions or did, we did get language back from the revisor's office. It is, there were only some minor changes, nothing substantive. If you wanted me to walk through that with you, I could, um, or, answer questions you have, or let me know if this is good to go. Are there any questions for Lindsay on the fiscal note? And those minor changes are strictly technical. That's correct. Okay. So I think that is probably unnecessary unless anyone wishes to see it. Are there any concerns, objections? Okay. And Jason, I'm, um, I've been asked to request that you send another link uh, to Senator Breen. Is that possible? It, it sure is. I just sent one out, but I'll send oh, another one. Okay. Is that to her legislative email address? Yeah, yes, it is. Okay, there is one other, um, I think relatively small matter that I actually wanted to take up at some point today and, and perhaps we could do that. Um, it would require uh, voting to go into a work session, um, which we can easily do um, at any time. Representative Wadsworth had requested to be recorded differently on a bill, I believe it was LD 1847. And, um, uh, it, it just requires that we uh, provide him with the, the, the opportunity to um, reconsider our votes. This was a bill where um, the majority voted uh, ought to pass as amended. The, um, the, the minority voted ought to pass as amended with a different amendment. And it's a bill pertaining to um, 
utility disconnections at public safety facilities. So uh, I would entertain a motion at this time to go into work session on LD 1847. So moved. Okay, it's been moved by Representative Sachs as our second, seconded by Senator Stewart. And uh, at this time, the chair would entertain a motion to reconsider our vote on LD 1847. So moved. Okay, moved by Representative Sachs, seconded by Senator Stewart. Uh, so the bill is now before us again. And the original motion was ought to pass as amended um, with statutory changes. I believe the minority vote ended up with um, essentially uh, rulemaking changes. Lindsay, do you want to um, agree or disagree with that? Oh, bear with me one moment. Let me bring up the minority report. Okay. So the minority report does um, does make a statutory change, but it is a change which directs the PUC to engage in rulemaking governing the termination or disconnection of utility services for a public safety facility. Right. So that's kind of the difference. The majority report was more um, about, you know, enacting some provisions directly into statute. Both of them had an emergency preamble. Um, are there any other questions about you know, what the committee did with that? Just uh, as a refresher, we all good? Okay, so uh, I would need a motion to, um, to enact the bill, to, to recommend that the bill be um, enacted ought to pass as amended, presumably with the language in the majority report. So moved. All right, it's been moved by Representative Sachs. Is there a second? Thank you, uh, Representative Cuddy. And is there any discussion? All right. Um, could the committee clerk please call the roll? Okay. Uh, Senator Lawrence. And Senator Lawrence is not here. Uh, Senator Vitelli. Yes. Senator Vitelli is a yes. Senator Stewart. No. Senator Stewart is a no. Representative Barry. Yes. Representative Barry is a yes. Representative Cuddy. Yes. Representative Cuddy is a yes. Representative Grahowski. Yes. Representative Grahowski is a yes. Representative Kessler. Yes. Representative Kessler is a yes. Representative Representative Ziegler. Yes. Representative Ziegler is a yes. Representative Sachs. Yes. Representative Sachs is a yes. Representative Wadsworth. No. Representative Wadsworth is a no. Representative Grignon. It's not present. Representative Foster. No. Representative Foster is a no. Representative Carlo. No. Representative Carlo is a no. That is. Seven in favor and four opposed to the motion. Great. And absence. from those who voted no, um, it's my understanding that the minority report will be the um, Octopass's amended minority report, committee amendment B, if you will, um, from the previous vote. Is that correct? You got it. Yep. Okay. Yep. <clears throat> Great. Lindsay, thank, any, anything else you need on you that? All for, thank you all for the courtesy. I appreciate that. No problem. Okay, so that will conclude the, the, the work session on LD 1847. And I think the, uh, Lindsay will get back to us if she needs another language review. Um, I'm thinking we, we may or may not need that, but um, I believe we have a sponsor with us now to present a bill pertaining to the Gray Water District. And Jason, if you could bring in Senator Breen uh, as a panelist, that would be great. Excellent. Welcome, Senator Breen. Good morning, Mr. Chair, um, Representative Barry, Senator Vitelli. Um, I'm Kathy Breen, and I apologize for getting caught off guard this morning. Um, I really appreciate your reaching out and indulging me. Um, <clears throat> this is a, a fairly straightforward bill that I know that um, folks in your committee have seen many times. This is a change to um, some boundaries of a water district in, in my Senate district. And um, the parties negotiated it prior to putting, to reaching out to me for the bill. Um, and uh, so everybody agreed, it's uh, sort of a technicality and um, I'm hoping that it can go through without much fanfare, um, but I'm certainly open to any questions if you 
have any. Okay, and um, are there questions from the committee for Senator Breen? Very well, thanks for jumping on. And uh, I apologize if there was any miscommunication on our part. No, my, my aide has been out sick and so I'm just discombobulated. And so I, it's all my fault and I apologize. Oh my gosh, I hope your aide feels better. And Thank you. I can imagine that that would be discombobulating. <laughs> all right. All right, no excuse. Care. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Take care. All right. And uh, Jason, can you bring in uh, the, the next person to sign up to testify in support of this legislation? I don't believe there are co-sponsors planning to testify. I'm bringing over Bill Gardner. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Gardner, we can see you. Uh, we see a square for you, but uh, you'll need to unmute. There we go. We got it. <laughs> okay. Can, are you Very able to? Tall. Yep. You hear me? We can hear you, but not see you. Are you able to turn on your video? I think oh, I there you got go. it. Well done. All right. All right. Apologize. Sorry about that. No, no problem. No problem. Good morning, y'all. So, uh, my name is Phil Gardner. I'm, I'm the superintendent of the Grand Water District, and uh, I also have one of our board members here, Mike Mike McDonald, as well. Great. And uh, do you want to do you want to both both of you testify, or just one designated driver today? Uh, I can handle most of it, and any questions you you may have, um, we we are approached by uh, NOAA Weather Service. Uh, to get water up to them due to their low pressure issues and the multiple wells that they had had drilled. Um, unfortunately, it puts us into the town of New Gloucester's territory. Um, we would we would actually go into their territory a little bit and then come back into the town of Gray. Um, we have had approached New Gloucester on, on the issue. Um, it is too far away from their infrastructure and they have uh, uh, no plans of, of putting infrastructure uh, in that area. So that's why uh, we, we were reached out. And I think you could, I don't know if you all have it, but we have a letter of support from the town of New Gloucester and also from the town of Gray, who has expressed um, their interest in, in no weather service remaining uh, within the town Gray limits. And that's the, the first portion of the bill. The second addresses an issue where um, we had extended into Yarmouth Water District about 10 years ago, entered into an agreement with them, approved through the PUC. It was just never entered into our charter before we were here. So we are hoping to um, get that wording in, in the charter as well. Um, and then the last um, is just uh, uh, goes to holding uh, board members accountability. I'd be happy to answer any questions on those things. Okay, any questions for Mr. Gardner? All right, uh, seeing none. Um, uh, who do we have signed up next to testify, Jason? Uh, it looks like Bradley Sawyer. Okay. So any, any other testimony, uh, Bill, from you or your colleague? Um, I'm, I apologize, I missed your colleague's name. Did he want to testify also? Uh, Mike McDonald, no, I've, I've helped engineer this and, and uh, worked with the Gray Water District for a long time. These are uh, things that come up that uh, we need just need to address it so that we can uh, uh, provide the service. Okay, very good. Any questions for Mr. McDonald? All right, seeing none, thank you both very much. And uh, we'll beam you back over to the attendee panel. And we appreciate your testimony. Uh, Mr. Sawyer. Uh, Jason, could you bring Mr. Sawyer in? He's, He's on his way over. Oh, okay, great. I apologize, I do not have the list in front of me. It's like technical glitch today, but uh, I know Jason has it, so that's all we need. All right, Mr. Sawyer, welcome. Thank you, uh, Chair Barry and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Brad Sawyer. I work with the Maine Rural Water Association. 
we helped the gray water district uh, with this, with some of the language and work around this. Uh, I apologize, Representative Grahowski, I, I do not have written testimony, but solely because uh, I, I don't really have any new information to share. Um, I, with the Friday deadline and, and the pace of work you all have, I thought if there's a possibility of, of moving this uh, along today, I just wanted to make sure I was in the room to answer any questions you all had. Uh, the, the only thing I would add from Mr. Gardner's testimony is the, the third section about um, board member compensation is, is not anything to do with, a, with current members of the board. Uh, that is purely something uh, looking forward as a, as a potential backstop uh, and not in effort, in effort in any way uh, related to current board members. So I, I just wanted to put that out there. Um, with that, I'm happy to take any questions and uh, happy to support this committee as you move forward on it. Okay, questions for Mr. Sawyer? Representative Wadsworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Nice to see you, Mr. Sawyer. Is Yeah, this language, uh, is this common in other water districts that uh, may be members of yours. Uh, I don't remember seeing uh, language like this before, kind of penalizing uh, water district board members. It's, it's interesting. Thank you for the question, Representative. Uh, it's interesting. Board member compensation it, across water districts is, is certainly not uniform. It, it's incredibly common. I'd say it's, it, it is normal for board members to be compensated in some way. Um, some, sometimes that's a yearly stipend, sometimes that's a meeting stipend. Uh, there can be provisions for regular versus emergency meetings. Um, and, and so I, to be honest, I don't know how common um, possible deductions are, but I think uh, in, in the increasingly busy world we see, and, and there have been some instances of public officials elsewhere in the state um, getting elected to positions and, and not really showing up. Uh, I think this was an effort to uh, just kind of safeguard against that moving forward. Thank you. Great. Other questions? All right. Seeing none. Thank you, Mr. Sawyer, for your testimony. Thank you. And Jason, do we have others signed up to testify on this bill? Uh, th those are the only two that I have on my list. Okay. So that will conclude the public hearing on this bill. And um, Jason, I am having some technical difficulties. Could you read the title of that bill again and the uh, number uh, just for the record? This, this bill is 19, LD 1967, an act to amend the charter of the Gray Water District. Thank you very much. And I wanna turn at this time to our analyst. Uh, Lindsay, if the committee felt comfortable going into work session and voting on this, would you be able to provide just a brief, a very brief analysis that would enable us to do that? Um, well, I haven't reviewed this um, thoroughly. I, I can tell you that the, you know, you know, one of the issues that we usually look for when we see these water district or these district charters is whether there's any sort of issues with constitutionality. Um, I'm not seeing anything here which seems problematic. Um, the, the construction of infrastructure into New Gloucester, um, it sounds like that is to serve, still continuing to serve district residents. Like it's not, the intent isn't to expand the district. I mean, that is something the committee, if they wanted to, they could clarify, they could have language to clarify that. Um, and I'm not, I haven't, I'm not familiar with the sort of um, water and fire service language, um, but I haven't, honestly, I haven't looked, I haven't done an analysis on this. So I don't know if there would be any additional clarification that might be needed, um, but certainly if the committee wanted to go into work session, you absolutely could. Got it. And if we were to go into work session and you saw anything that jumped out as, at you as being uh, constitutionally troublesome uh, or dramatically unprecedented, you could let us know 
at the language review, correct? Absolutely. Okay. So I guess my personal uh, instinct is to just go ahead into work session. If, if uh, folks are comfortable with that, we could easily do that and um, tick this one off of our list, knowing that Lindsay will bring it back to us if there are concerns and we will see it again at a language review. Um, so I would entertain a motion if, if there is uh, no objection to go into work session. Uh, Representative Wadsworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I, I move that we go into work session on LD 1967. It's been moved to go into work session. Is there a second? Seconded by Representative Cuddy. All those in favor of going into work session, indicate by a show of hands. Thank you. Should have done that on the earlier one. And uh, that puts the bill before us. And is there a motion? Representative Wadsworth. Uh, I move we pass LD 1967 as drafted. Okay, it's been moved out to pass. Is there a second? Uh, Senator Vitelli, second. And Jason, could you call the roll? Oh, excuse me, is there any discussion first? Let me just provide that opportunity. All right, hearing none. Jason, could you call the roll? Senator Lawrence is not present. Senator Vitelli? Yes. Senator Vitelli is a yes. Senator Stewart? Yes. Senator Stewart is a yes. Representative Barry? Yes. Representative Barry is a yes. Representative Cuddy? Yes. Representative Cuddy is a yes. Representative Grahowski? Yes. Representative Grahowski is a yes. Representative Kessler? Yes. Representative Kessler is a yes. Representative Ziegler? Representative Ziegler is not present. Representative Sachs? Yes. Representative Sachs is a yes. Representative Wadsworth? Yes. Representative Wadsworth is a yes. Representative Grignon is not present. Representative Foster? Yes. Representative Foster is a yes. Representative Carlo? Yes. Representative Carlo is a yes. It's 10 in favor of the motion. Two absent, three absent, I'm sorry. Great. Well, that concludes uh, our work on that bill. And I'm going to turn the reins over at this time to Senator Vitelli to chair so I can present another bill, LD 697. Senator Vitelli. Great. Thank you, Representative <clears throat> Barry. Um, I'm happy to chair this public hearing on LD 697. Uh, I understand there's a sponsor's amendment, but we will hear from the sponsor first and um, he can walk us through what this bill is proposing. Representative Barry. Thank you very much, Senator Vitelli and members of the committee. Uh, as you know, I'm Seth Barry representing House District 55 and I'm very pleased to present today the amended language sent out last week for LD 697. Uh, the original title of this bill was an act to enhance the energy security of Maine residents, uh, but it really uh, in its amended form would go beyond that to gas and water. So a better title to reflect the amendment before you would be an act to reduce risks to Maine's critical infrastructure. As amended, LD 697 will require the Public Utilities Commission to deny any future purchase of a main utility by a foreign entity, corporation or government, if it risks losses to reliability, customer privacy and safety, regulatory capacity, and or our state's economy. As this committee knows better than most, our utilities today provide critical monopoly service on which our lives and livelihoods depend. Even as I speak to you, Wars are being fought elsewhere in the world over energy, over gas, and over water. At the same time, at least two of our utilities in Maine are today owned by foreign governments, either in whole or in part. This is a new phenomenon. 
driven by the recent rise of globalization, state-owned enterprises, and state-owned sovereign wealth funds. And here is where we come in, main policymakers, as the only authorities chosen by the people to represent their interests. Our laws, written largely in the last century, provide the PUC with no playbook for the present. In the case of Versant, Versant Power, through intermediary uh, uh, companies, ownership and control is held 100% by a foreign government. In the case of Central Maine Power, again, through two layers of inter intermediaries, two of the largest single beneficial owners or shareholders are the governments of Qatar and Norway. We're very fortunate that at present, all of these nations are allies. But once approved, an ownership structure may persist for decades. What happens when tomorrow's, excuse me, what happens when today's ally becomes tomorrow's adversary? Main law is silent on this point, simply because our situation has no precedent. This bill would not impact CMP or Versant's current structure, to be clear. It's prospective, not retroactive. It protects our critical infrastructure going forward, not only for the security of our electricity, but also our gas, water, and other services. Before approving any change in ownership or control of Maine's critical monopoly infrastructure, it is important that we ask our regulators to carefully scrutinize the potential risks and rewards of the transaction in relation to today's challenging and complex global realities. Today's sophisticated and IT dependent utility infrastructure. By clarifying the guidance we provide to our Public Utilities Commission in judging the net benefit standard for any future utility reorganization, the language before you today would provide for this additional safeguard against unintentional risk. Now, as I mentioned, uh, Versant is uh, today owned by a very friendly foreign government, the, gov the city of Calgary in Alberta, Canada. Uh, many of those who helped to win PUC approval for purchase of, of Emera Maine by Versant uh, by Calgary really, are here today and will testify on this bill. They may, may wish to recount their roles in the proceeding and their perspectives. I would welcome that. What I wanna call your attention to about that docket is that the Public Utilities Commission Chair, Chair Bartlett, um, I think was very perceptive and wise in asking some tough questions questions which ultimately were not answered in the docket. He stated in December 2019, on page, starting at page 38 of the record on that proceeding, quote, how do we value the risks of foreign ownership? It's unquestionable, he continued, we would all agree that there are certain foreign governments we would, should, um, excuse me, it's unquestionable I think there's a transcript error. It's unquestionable there are certain foreign governments we would all agree should not own a utility in Maine. And skipping ahead in his statements, should there be any parameters around it? Or is it purely sort of a gut check kind of a thing? Skipping ahead a little further, he said he stated, are there particular concerns we should have about a foreign government of any kind owning the utility. And just following that, after another brief uh, ellipsis, he stated, and I'll conclude here, I feel like we are setting a precedent here. Well, uh, members of the committee, in the decision to approve Versant, uh, a precedent was set. Our commission made, it, made its best judgment based on the lack of statutory guidance, the utter lack of statutory guidance on these matters. And more than two years later, uh, from the time of, of those prescient remarks by the commission chair, 
no parameters exist in main law. And for that matter, none exist in commission rule. CMB's ownership structure also set new precedents. For the first time starting back in 2005, a main utility was owned by a Spanish-based parent company with significant foreign government ownership. That company had its origins, in fact, in the regime of Francisco Franco. It had significant ownership by a Spanish bank and since by uh, the, the government of Qatar and the government of Norway. At that time in 2005 and, and under later reorganizations, it seemed to our regulators like an okay idea. Certainly nothing conflicted with main law. Today, I think we can all look back and see things a little differently with the benefit of 2020 hindsight. We all know today that CMP's distant multi-layered ownership structure has helped to cause massive declines in quality of service, massive increases to the monies exported from our state's economy, and a precipitous drop in customer satisfaction. This ownership structure indeed has recently been the subject of an expensive audit at the PUC and is now the topic of an expensive new PUC management inquiry. It's caused us some headaches. Had LD697 been law before the Iberdrola takeover and the subsequent reorganization in 2013, at least some of the problems we have seen with CMP could doubtless have been avoided. Perhaps as New Mexico's regulators recently decided that ownership structure might've been rejected and a better deal pursued. But left entirely without legislative guardrails against foreign or foreign government ownership, our commissioners, as I've stated, have struggled. At best, today's arrangement with CMP and Versant's beneficial owners is bad business, a wasteful and costly export of money from our economy. Today, we pay nine to 12% interest for equity capital that costs foreign governments like Calgary only two to 3% to borrow because in fact, they're not borrowing at equity rates. It's good business for them and it's bad business for me. But at worst, the unmarked path on which we now wander not only jeopardizes the proper reach of regulatory oversight, but if unchecked, it will also put at risk the very security and safety of our state and its residents in future utility reorganizations. We have many utilities in Maine, they do critical work on our behalf. We depend on them for our lives and livelihoods. Let's protect those utilities and make sure that our commissioners have future guardrails in statute from which to make the, to exercise their own best judgment. I urge you to support uh, this amendment. Uh, thank you for listening. I'll be happy to try to answer any questions. Thank you, Representative Barry. Are there questions for the representative? Representative Sachs. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Barry, for bringing this forward. Um, just a question. I, uh, number one, I look forward to your written testimony being submitted so that we can take a look at it. Thank you. Um, yeah. It's coming. And, it's coming, I promise. Um, and, well, it, I'm not sure, not having it in front of me, are you making the argument that it is any investor owned, whether it's foreign or not, is bad because of the cost of capital, or is it specifically foreign owned investors? Thank you for that excellent question. The, um, the bill pertains very specifically to ownership by a foreign government or a foreign corporation. Um, and I'm speaking specifically, as you know, to the sponsor's amendment here. The concern is that it is much harder to exercise effective regulatory oversight. Uh, it is harder to guarantee the security of that critical infrastructure when the ownership, the true beneficial ownership, the true control comes from outside of US jurisdictional capabilities. 
I may have one follow up, Madam Chair. Yes, go ahead, Representative. Thank you. Um, and so when you say that this bill puts appropriate guardrails, are you saying then that the POC, PUC will have the the correct information to be able to see, as you said, be prescient in terms mm -hmm. of global politics, energy policy, um, federal regulations to be able to evaluate risk um, when a proposed change comes based on your language and your amendment. Yeah, the, so the PUC representative, thank you for the excellent question, would be given some additional things to look at. They will need to look in those instances at how the reorganization will impact customer reliability, how it will impact uh, the security of customers, how it will impact the state's economy, and how it will impact their own ability to effectively regulate. So those are kind of the three prongs to the tests that are identified in the subsections, right? The commission, as always, is empowered, is required really to determine the finer points within the parameters that we set. So at present, the standard is, does this reorganization offer a net benefit to the customers of the utility? And the history there is, is interesting. Uh, in, in the past, the standard was a no harm standard. Uh, the, this legislature, excuse me, the previous legislature changed that to a net benefit standard. Uh, it's unclear exactly how much that means. You know, could, could, could you add two cents to the deal, you know, in net benefits to, 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 the, to the customers? And does that make it, a, you know, rather than no harm, a net benefit? Um, but the commission uh, had that net benefit standard in place when they did their best to interpret it in the Versant Power proceeding that I cited. And it in those remarks from uh, the chair, from, from Chairman Bartlett, it, it, what, what he was really calling attention to was the, the utter lack of precedent and indeed the lack of legal uh, parameters from which to judge the specifics of the deal. So a number, if you, if you read forward from page 38 in that proceeding, in that December 2019 meeting, um, you see a number of, of stakeholders weighing in. Um, and I'm happy to, to speak a little bit more about that. Uh, but, I, you know, in the interest of time, I'll just say that there was, a, was an, an utter lack of clarity about what precedent was being set and what the standards should be uh, to, to, to begin to answer the questions that Chair Bartlett was asking. Is that helpful? Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Are there, are there other, other questions, questions for Representative Barry? Seeing none, thank you very much. We will now turn to others speaking in favor and I believe we have um, the Senator with us, Senator Rick Bennett. So Jason, if you could ask Senator Bennett to join us, we'll hear from him first. And then there's, I think four or five others in the waiting room that we'll get to next. There he is. Good morning, Senator. Good morning. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Senator Vitelli, Representative Barry, distinguished members of the Committee on Energy, Utilities and Technology. I am Senator Rick Bennett of Oxford. I have the honor of serving 13 towns in Oxford and Cumberland counties in the main Senate. I'm pleased to speak in favor of this important legislation, LD 697, this morning. As you know, in the 129th legislature, a law was passed requiring that when there is a change in ownership or control of a utility, the PUC must determine uh, whether there is a net benefit to the public. And as uh, Representative Barry just mentioned, prior to that, there was a no harm standard. In my view, this law does not go far enough 
in protecting the public interest in the event of foreign ownership. Enacting LD 697 as amended will require regulators to deny utility ownership to distant, self-interested foreign governments and companies if allowing a buyout would hurt the safety, privacy, or wallets of main utility customers. Such reform is overdue. Over the years, Mainers have seen their utility providers change hands multiple times. Today, we let foreign governments own our critical utility infrastructure outright, and also let them spend unlimited money to influence our elections. What could possibly go wrong? We know that Versant is 100% owned by the city of Calgary, Canada. Yes, Bangor ratepayers are subsidizing street paving in Canada. And CMP is 100% owned by Avangrid, which in turn is 82% owned by the Spanish conglomerate Iberdrola. Who are the largest owners of Iberdrola? The government controlled sovereign wealth funds of Qatar and Norway. And by the way, Iberdrola's CEO, Sanchez Galan, is still under investigation in Spain for bribery and fraud. Now, under the rules of the New York Stock Exchange, Avangrid is what's a controlled company. And so it does not need to have a majority of independent directors. As a consequence, the puppet masters of our state's largest utility have no compunction about repeatedly suing the people of Maine, its customers. Our election transmission and distribution utilities, as we all know, are natural monopolies. Foreign ownership of our grid makes no sense. At best, it creates perverse incentives, bad service, and underinvestment in the infrastructure that Maine needs to grow our economy and tackle the challenges of this century. At worst, it's dangerous to our national security as well. If another foreign government wanted to buy CMP or Versant or a water or telephone or gas utility, what would stop them? Literally nothing in Maine law. I note that the PUC and the public advocate are testifying neither for nor against this bill. That's probably as it should be because the issues addressed by this bill are not technical or regulatory in nature. They relate rather to geopolitical and social risks best addressed by us, the elected representatives of the people. I urge the committee to pass LD 697 as amended and create real guardrails to foreign ownership of our electric grid. Thank you very much. We're pleased to entertain any questions. Thank you, Senator. Are there any questions for Senator Bennett? Seeing none, we thank you for being with thank us here you. this morning. And Jason, I believe there's another representative in our waiting room, Jennifer, Representative Jennifer Poirier. If you could ask her to join us, please. And then it looks like we'll be able to go to members of the public. There she is. Good morning, Representative. Good morning, all. I hope you are doing well. <laughs> um, dueling Zooms here, so I apologize for being a little off here. Um, Senator Lawrence, Representative Barry, and distinguished colleagues, I am Representative Jennifer Poirier, and I proudly represent the people of House District 107, which is all of Skowhegan and part of Madison. Um, LD 697 is very important to the integrity of critical infrastructure in Maine. For decades, we have heard the pleas to buy local and to purchase items made in the USA. The public utilities of Maine should consider using the same logics and standards. Maine law does not prohibit a public utility from being owned or purchased by a foreign corporation or foreign government. Our current electric um, utility monopolies are owned by Quebec, Spain, and Qatar, as you've, as you've heard. Um, there's nothing in Maine law that would prevent the sale of current utilities to countries like China or even Russia, as long as it's suggested that their rates would not increase. 
Representative Barry's amendment to LD 697 affords greater protections for Maine consumers. Uh, potential utility owners would be required to show how their acquisition would benefit Maine. The commission would look at the criteria such as lower rates and improved local control. And they would also evaluate, evaluate potential risks in regard to reliability, privacy, and safety. It cannot be denied that the current public utilities owned by foreign entities have been failing the people of Maine for many years. As representative voices of the people of Maine, it's our duty to provide greater oversight and integrity in the process in which businesses operate in our state. Given the uneasy state of current foreign relations, I would urge you all to vote ought to pass on LD 697 as amended um, to hold foreign governments accountable um, and these foreign corporations hold them to higher standards. The people of Maine are watching and waiting for us to do the right thing and protect their interests. Thank you for your time and consideration. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Great, thank you very much, Representative. Are there any questions from members of the committee? Okay, seeing none, thank you for being with us this morning. We will now turn thank to you. members of the public wishing to speak four. Uh, and I have first on my list, uh, Wayne Jortner, and then um, Jason, if you could line up. Uh, the next one is Jill Lindsay. And I believe we also have Gary Friedman. And we'll take it from there, but we'll start with those three. So first, Wayne Jortner, is he with us? Moving from different screens here, but I think I see him. There you are. Good morning. Good morning. Thank let us know your name and association, where you're from, and your Thank remarks. you. Thank, thank you for having me. My name is Wayne Jortner. I'm from Freeport, Maine. And I was employed by the public advocate for about um, 23 years until 2014 when I retired. <clears throat> During that time, I worked on many cases involving reorganizations um, and mergers under Section 708 of our public utility laws. Reflecting now on that experience, my most significant and lasting impression is that with one or two possible exceptions, Maine was worse off every time the PUC approved a major reorganization that resulted in Maine's ratepayers becoming more distant from the ultimate owners of the new utility corporation. So just a moment of history, for most of its history, the PUC had to follow a standard that was merely finding no adverse impact on ratepayers when it approved major reorganizations or mergers. In 2007, I was asked to testify before the full Democratic caucus considering a bill that would require an affirmative finding of a net benefit to ratepayers. That bill failed by a few votes, I believe, in 2007, and that was in the face of impending important mergers at the time, and those mergers went forward based upon the old um, no adverse impact standard, which was a very weak standard. But then in 2019, the legislature finally acted and did um, enact a net benefit standard, which as Representative, Representative Barry said, you know, it's just, it could be two cents in favor of the net benefit. It doesn't really apply a very strong standard. And I think it needs to be strengthened. So let me give you an example in telecommunications industry, which I did a little bit more work in than in the electric industry. Um, about 85% of people were served by New England Telephone, which then merged with New York Telephone to form 9X, which then merged to become part of Bell Atlantic, which served most of the East Coast, which eventually merged with uh, telecom giant GTE, which was a, had property all across the country, and that formed Verizon. And each of these reorganizations made Maine dramatically less important to the corporate owners that served them. Not long after Verizon became the owner, it was clear that Verizon had virtually no interest in serving the ratepayers of Maine. And as we know, in order to benefit from a tax loophole, it handed it over to a small, weak utility that was completely unprepared to reasonably serve Maine customers and with disastrous consequences. I suggest that a similar phenomenon is happening in Maine's electric, electric utility sector. 
Now that CMT's owner is a huge international corporation owned by foreign, private, and governmental shareholders, and Versant is 100% owned by a foreign governmental entity, these distant owners have no intrinsic concern for the welfare of Maine customers or the local Maine environment. Both the boards and the management of these utilities ultimately have a fiduciary duty mainly to their shareholders and not nearly so much to ratepayers. And promises to appoint local board members is a false reassurance because those fiduciary duties remain um, no matter what, no matter who's on the board. Thank you, Mr. Jordan, if I could ask you to wrap up shortly here. Sure, I'll be just another 30 seconds. So in every case, utilities presented um, very rosy pictures of the benefits of these mergers. And in every case, those, those benefits did not materialize. The PUC has pretty much approved every utility reorganization plan that has come before it, but the results in hindsight have never been um, very good for Maine people. So in this case, LD697, it provides some specific guidance on one particular aspect of the harm that could come to Maine from reorganization mergers, and that's the security risks that flow from foreign ownership of our utilities. So I would urge you to, to pass this bill. Thank you. Thank you very much for your remarks. Are there questions for Mr. Jordan? Representative Foster. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Jordner, uh, and, and thank you for uh, taking me back to the days uh, when you discussed the uh, sequence of events in the uh, telecommunications area. Uh, I remember it well, and uh, I would assume that you uh, remember, as I do, that it was government intervention when uh, Marbell, uh, which New England Telephone was part of, uh, was uh, forced to break up that led to much of what you went through in your uh, dissertation on what's happened with the telephone companies over the years. And uh, as my bell put a lot of food on my folks table when I was a kid, I certainly uh, appreciate what has happened in that arena. Uh, and I, I think uh, I at least would go back to say it was the government that started that whole mess. Uh, I, I would ask if you feel the same way about that. Yeah, I would partially agree with you. The you know, a well-regulated monopoly could, could be a very good system. And that's what we had under when AT&T was Ma Bell and, you know, was the, the monopoly for the entire country. It, it worked well because it was well-regulated. Then the government decided to intervene, as you say, and the idea was to create competition, which could be even better than a well-regulated monopoly. Competition, when it works well, is probably the best system. But the back, it backfired, and it backfired because these country, these companies all decided to merge rather than to compete. And we ended up with pretty much a monopoly, but way less regulated than it was before. So we ended up with Verizon and AT&T, a duopoly, which didn't compete that much with each other. They pretty much divided up the territory of the country. So the idea of creating competition by the government backfired, and I would agree with you that that government intervention didn't turn out very well. Thank Representative you. Foster. Representative Grahoski. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you, Mr. Jordner, for being here and sharing your wealth of expertise with us. Um, I think that the so the new net benefit standard, which has, has been discussed, is I think um, it, you know better than a do no harm standard, but doesn't have a lot of specificity around it. I think um, that came through in 2019 and was used for the sale of Amera to NMAX, which is now Versant. And I was um, a party to that uh, sale and, and tried to learn how to participate in the PUC through that process. And what I distinctly recall was the Public Utilities Commission staff and commissioners having a lot of uh, challenges around deciding what was a net benefit. Like, like we said, is it two cents or is it, uh, how, do, what, how is it significant to people? And so I thought in reading this bill that it sort of flips the script a little bit in terms of thinking about actual benefits that we'd want to see. And then also the specificity around uh, foreign government ownership in part three. So my question for you is, do you think that this additional guidance will help 
the public advocates office and other people that are trying to advocate for the best interests of main ratepayers to get a better outcome in future processes, um, or is this not so necessary because the PUC could technically come to these conclusions themselves? Is this going to be a, a helpful regulatory tool in your view? Yeah, I think it is helpful because it provides a little bit of specificity and a little bit of teeth to what's otherwise a very vague standard. So, you know, if we, as we've discussed, net benefits or no adverse harm, it's basically a, predict, a prediction about the future, which is hard to do. And the PUC has a lot of discretion in how to determine what's going to happen in the future. They don't have a crystal ball. So this at least provides some specificity. And what I would love to see the language of this bill strengthen, because I think it would be appropriate to tell the PUC to presume that there's going to be an adverse impact by making Maine a much smaller part um, of, a, of a much bigger utility, and also one that um, is subject to government, government, foreign governmental ownership or foreign shareholder ownership. Those could be presumptions that the PUC could be asked to, um, to uh, consider uh, when it for when it weighs the benefits or the harms of any uh, reorganization. Representative Gohaski, do you have a follow-up? Um, yeah, yes, and thank you for that clarification. I want to look into that a bit more. I think that could be helpful. Um, I just wanted to um, also ask you, just thinking about how the PUC is structured, is it, um, if we don't specifically tell it how to consider ratepayers, is it, does it do that? primarily, or is it also interested in um, balancing the, the needs of the utilities? Um, I hope that question makes sense. Yeah, well, I mean, I've commented before that, you know, when it comes to rate setting, the statute specifically tells the PUC to look after shareholders' interests um, at the same time that it looks after ratepayers' interests. So it's not a ratepayer advocate by any means when it comes to rate setting. When it comes to this issue, it's a similar, it's a similar, um, Non, you know, you know, not nonpartisan is not the right word, but it's it's similarly um, not a ratepayer advocate by any means. No, finding no adver no adverse impact to ratepayers is um, not the same thing as providing affirmative benefits to ratepayers. And what the utilities are presented with are all kinds of promises by utilities about all the benefits that will result from mergers and reorganizations. They put on a great show every time they want to sell a merger and reorganization. And the PUC, in my experience, has generally bought into those promises. You know, Fairpoint was supposed to have like the greatest back end, back end system to make the, everything run much, much more smoothly than Verizon. And that was complete. That turned out to be completely wrong. It was just the opposite. So the um, PUC is not, even by this standard, is not going to be a ratepayer advocate. It's it needs to be told what categories of items are inherently adverse to ratepayers and foreign, go foreign government ownership. And in my opinion, just becoming a smaller, more distant part of a big corporation should be deemed automatically adverse impacts. You all set representative? Yes, thank you so much. Uh, are there other questions from the committee for Mr. Jordan? Uh, Representative Barry, you have a clarifying not question? Actually, thank you. Not actually a question, but um, I just want to thank you, Mr. Jordan, for sharing your 23 years of expertise at the Office of the Public Advocate. And uh, we always appreciate those who volunteer their time uh, to give back to their state uh, in that way and to provide their expertise. So thank you. My pleasure. And thank you for being with us this morning. Thank you. Um, thank you. Jason, I think next we have Jill Lindsay speaking in favor, and then we'll also go to Gary Friedman if he is still in the waiting room. We can bring him over, cue him up for next. So, Ms. Lindsay, if you can introduce yourself, and hopefully, there you go. We can now see you as well. Senator Vitelli, Representative Barry, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak before you today. My name is Jill Lindsay and I live in New Harbor. I'm here today to speak on behalf of the Maine Unitarian Universalist State Advocacy Network. 
our statewide organization is here in support of this important amendment at, to LD 697. We're concerned that there is currently nothing in Maine law that would prevent a foreign government from purchasing CMP or versant, or for that matter, a water, telephone, or gas utility in our state. For more than a century, Maine utilities were owned and managed locally. A growing number of Maine citizens, many of whom are unhappy with our current foreign owned utilities, would like to see us return to more local control. And local control of our utilities makes so much more sense economically for Maine. But at the very least, we should be protecting the security of our invaluable utilities from ownership by a self-interested and potentially hostile foreign government. We ask you to support this uh, important amended version of LD 697. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lindsay. Are there questions for Ms. Lindsay? Seeing none, we appreciate you being with us here this morning. And we will now turn to Mr. Gary Friedman. Good Go morning. ahead, sir. Good morning, uh, members of the Energy Utilities Technology Committee. Thank you for having me here. My name is Gary Friedman, and I'm uh, speaking for myself this morning, but I have been a member of the Bar Harbor Town Council for 10 years, and uh, my experience comes from having um, been one of the founders of A Climate to Thrive, which has the objective of making Mount Desert Island energy independent by 2030. And, um, and, and my experience with uh, the PUC and, and utilities goes to um, our uh, work here on MDI through Climate to Thrive to bring uh, great quantities of solar energy into the grid and to make other improvements um, locally uh, that involve interconnection with our, our utility, which is now Versant. And um, when, uh, when NMAX, uh, the city of Calgary's utility, um, proposed to buy Amera, um, we, uh, we were very concerned about what that would mean for um, for the, the plans that we had for, for our area. And we um, applied to intervene in the merger and acquisition case at the PUC to, to make our concerns heard. And we did testify before the PUC about, about um, wanting to see that there would be a benefit uh, from this merger um, where we would ask uh, NMAX to be committed to incorporating more solar energy, more renewables on the grid um, we asked for their support for a, a demonstration microgrid project that we have uh, in the works here. And, um, and then we, uh, we ended up um, signing on to a settlement uh, for the, the acquisition, um, agreeing uh, simply that, um, that, that NMAX would, would talk with us, would come to Monster Island and hear our, our concerns. Um, in conversations with the, uh, with the public advocate, you know, who was very interested in our efforts to help um, meet the governor's climate council's goals of reducing uh, carbon emissions in Maine. Um, uh, you know, he was encouraging us to, to you know, participate in this uh, uh, merger and acquisition case. And I have to tell you that it's not easy um, being an intervener at the PUC. It involves many hours of following very dull and drab um, conversations. And in the end, the, uh, the PUC um, didn't really have the, uh, the teeth to require the kinds of um, uh, commitment to, a, um, to a, a incorporating more renewables on the, the grid than, than, uh, uh, than NMAX would choose to do. And I, you know, I wanna say that, that um, the people at NMAX were, were wonderful. You know, some very nice people came down from Calgary and made all kinds of promises and told us all the great things they were doing in, uh, in, in Calgary. But in the end, um, we saw nothing but foot dragging. Um, and uh, I would say um, a, a combination of indifference and hostility to um, incorporating renewables, to interconnecting large solar arrays on Mount Desert Island. So um, I, I'm speaking in favor of this bill because I believe that, that um, until the PUC has the teeth and the direction to require that, that foreign companies or corporations 
um, uh, benefit main ratepayers and communities that um, that they will not do that. And that that's what we've seen in the case of Verson. Thank you for your time this morning. Thank you, Mr. Friedman. And uh, Senator Vitelli will be right back. Um, so I'll just pick up in her absence. Are there questions for Mr. Friedman? Okay, we appreciate your joining us. Thank you. And uh, Jason, who's next? Uh, we have Steve Stephen Weems. Uh, I'll bring him right over. Great. And then there's also uh, Becky Bartokovic. Okay. So Mr. Weems is up and uh, Ms. Bartovic on deck and Steve Weems, we can see you, we can hear you, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Representative Barry, other members of the Joint Standing Committee on Energy, Utilities and Technology. <clears throat> My name is Steve Weems, Executive Director of the Solar Energy Association of Maine. I want to thank Senator Bennett for his eloquent testimony and uh, note that we filed written testimony yesterday and I apologize if we missed a deadline that would have it available for you today, uh, but it is in the queue. Uh, the association supports greater scrutiny and the use of higher standards in the evaluation of potential changes of ownership or control of larger electric transmission and distribution utilities as a general matter. LD 697 addresses this need, so we support it. Beyond this, its special focus on utility ownership or control by a foreign government or a foreign corporation seems especially important. In a world of increasing strife, energy supply uncertainty, and other results of international turmoil, Sponsor noted this uh, quite well in his introductory testimony. It clearly is time to be looking ahead at potential issues and being proactive to protect the well being of Maine people. All these factors compel the association to support the sponsor's amendment to LD 697. We agree with the underlying principle that a change of ownership or control of the utility should improve the situation, not just maintain the status quo or avoid worsening it. The status quo, especially as it relates to Maine's two investor-owned electric utilities is abysmal. These aspects of LD 697 are important improvements over the current law and the limitations of regulatory oversight. The association acknowledges the definition of a foreign corporation or its subsidiaries needs further specificity. And we think the Maine Public Utilities Commission will have difficulty with the conditional subjective nature of the language of section C3. We urge the EUT committee to work on these problematic aspects of the language without diluting the intent of LD 697. I'll stop there and thank you for your service and for listening. Thank you and uh, I apologize. Uh, the internet uh, fairies kicked me off uh, for a while, but I am back now. Uh, so caught some of what Mr. Weems had to say here. Thank you. Are there questions from the committee? Seeing none, thanks for being with us this morning and we will now go to um, Becky Bartovic, Bartovic, if I said that correctly, I apologize if not. Uh, please go right ahead. Uh, it's Becky Bartovic, and Sorry. good morning, um, uh, Senator Lawrence, actually, Senator Vitelli, and Representative Barry, and members of the EUT. Um, I am testifying on behalf of Sierra Club Maine, representing our 22,000 supporters and members statewide. Uh, founded in 1892, Sierra Club is one of our nation's oldest and largest environmental organizations, and we work diligently to amplify the power of our 3.8 million members nationwide as we work towards combating climate change and promoting a just and sustainable economy. 
To that end, we urge you to vote ought to pass for LD 697 as amended. Clearly the lack of oversight of our current foreign owned utility corporations has impacted the citizens of Maine by increasing profits for overseas shareholders at the expense of costs to our ratepayers and to the service of all users. I'm gonna to wanna to say that I very much appreciate, I'm going off message a little bit. I very much appreciate both um, all of the previous um, people who have spoken, Senator Bennett, um, uh, Representative Barry and others. I think that this is extremely important for us to really tighten up what we have um, before the PUC so that the PUC has the tools to look forward in increasingly difficult circumstances um, representing the security of our utilities. And we need to do what we can to keep the, the economy of state of Maine be of consideration. And this, this bill seems really prescient. Unfortunately, it wasn't put into effect in 2007 um, and, uh, and any time prior to this, but moving forward, you know, I think the suggestion that China uh, could purchase this or Russia or any other, you know, uh, corporate, uh, sorry, state um, could really impact our own abilities to, to move forward. So um, I strongly urge you on behalf of the members of Sierra Club uh, to vote ought to pass on LD 697 uh, as amended. Uh, thank you. And, and also, I very much appreciate this committee and listening to this. It's a really wonderful thank you. Well, thank you very much for that endorsement. Happy to have you with us today. Are there any questions for Becky Bartovics, Representative Grahowski? Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Ms. Bartovics, for being here. Um, I just was wondering, you know, whereby I think you think a lot about not only your members as members of your organization, but they're probably all ratepayers of these utilities or most of them are. I think you've been fairly involved in watching the PUC over a number of years on their behalf. And I wonder, um, do you have any additional thoughts based on your experience of how we could better ensure um, that benefits to main ratepayers. I mean, I think that the new section of language is really strong, but if you did have any thoughts about uh, what you've seen go down in all those transactions and, and additional protections, I would be certainly glad to hear them today or, or later on as a follow-up. I am, am not an expert on this at all. Dot Kelly has been Sierra Club's uh, representative before the PUC. I have testified on behalf of ratepayers on North Haven um, to the PUC um, because we have a, a municipally owned utility. But I would like to speak with Dot Kelly about this and then I would be happy to uh, give you any suggestions that, that we can work out together. But I thank you for your question. I am fascinated by this. I think it's very difficult. And I think the job that the PUC has before it you know, is constrained by lack of, um, support. Um, and I think this is a really great step forward. But if we could even tighten it further, as has been suggested, I, I hope we can do that. So thank you for that question. Great. Thank you. Any other questions from members of the committee? Okay. Seeing none, thank you for being with us this morning. Sharing your thoughts. Um, and Jason, on my list, I don't see anyone else ready to speak in favor nor do I see any interested in speaking against. So if that's correct, we'll turn to the three individuals who've signed up for speaking neither for nor, the, nor against. Is that correct? Do I have that right? I, I have the same thing on my list, thank you. Okay, great. So we'll next uh, ask um, William Harward to join us and share his perspective. And then we'll go to the remaining two in the list. Good morning. Good morning, Robert. apologize. Can you hear me okay? You certainly can. Sometimes it takes a while to get through that cornhole. <laughs> and I gotta find the mute and the, all that good stuff. Uh, thank you. Uh, 
So Representative Barry, distinguished members of the UT committee, my name is William Harwood and I'm here today as the public advocate testifying neither for nor against LD 1697. While the OPA appreciates Representative Barry's reasoning behind bringing forward this bill and its amendment, we believe it is not necessary. The current statutory standard for PUC approval of proposed reorganizations requires that the reorganization produce net benefits to ratepayers. We believe this standard is broad enough to allow all any parties, including the OPA, to raise exactly the type of concerns referenced in 697. Specifically, if we or any other party establishes that foreign ownership of a main utility is likely to harm ratepayers, the commission must consider that finding when weighing all the possible harms and benefits of the proposed reorganization when it reaches its decision whether to approve it or not. Thank you for your time and attention. I'd be happy to try and answer any questions and be available for the work session. Terrific. So I see a question from Representative Krohoski. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. Harwood, um, for being here. And I think you have a lot of experience with uh, reorganizations, as I recall. Um, one question I had was, I think it was just the last week, maybe, uh, or sometime recently, the day's blur, uh, you stated that um, the OPA was relatively outgunned. Uh, maybe it was even just at the budget hearing um, and that uh, it is very hard to go up against these um, powerful utilities with high paid lawyers uh, and lots of resources that they can draw from. And so I find it um, challenging and maybe you could better explain why it is that you feel that um, something as big as net benefits uh, in the regulatory structure we have is something that the OPA can adequately fight for, and especially as pertains to, um, you know, the, the, the maintenance or management um, and security of our critical infrastructure. I just, I find it hard to reconcile, you know, that statement with your statement today. And so maybe you could give more details about why you think that the OPA can do this adequately for main repairs without more guidance from the legislature to the PUC. Thank you, Representative Grahowski, for a good question. And I wanna uh, make sure the committee appreciates what an effective advocate you were for ratepayers in the Versa and NMAX reorganization. You uh, demonstrated how uh, parties can participate in that and bring exactly the issues in LD 697. The question of the, the mismatch of resources between the Office of Public Advocate and the large utilities of the state is, all, is a concern of mine and will continue to be a concern of mine. I am going to look, look carefully at the resources and will be back to you and others in the legislature if and when I determine that we can cost effectively uh, benefit the ratepayers by adding more uh, staff. Right now, we've got a terrific team of nine people over there who are working really hard every day to represent ratepayers. And I believe that we can do the job. Wayne Jortner, who testified earlier, did a wonderful job for many years of representing ratepayers in proposed reorganizations, and he showed how it can be done. I think we can do that, and we can identify the kinds of concerns that you've raised in this issue and go right at them. If it turns out that foreign ownership is the problem, we will either recommend that the PUC turn down the reorganization, or what is more often the case, we will recommend that conditions be attached to the approval of the reorganization, which address the specific concern so that we can then get to the point of saying, when you look at it with those conditions, it may satisfy the net benefits test. So I think we have the team and the resources to do this job, but time will tell if we need more. Representative Grahaski, do you have a follow-up? Um, yes, I think my follow-up question is, wouldn't, would you not see it as a, a, a better and more efficient use of OPA's existing resources and maybe, um, preclude the OPA from needing to lawyer up even more to fight basically what are, I think we could say two Goliaths at the table when there's a reorganization, <laughs> one on each side of the equation. 
by just making it more clear that there are certain things that we do need to have assessed. This bill is not, as I read it, saying that that a reorganization could not occur with these entities, but that the PUC must um, very carefully consider certain characteristics. So I just wonder, you know, would it hurt the OPA to have this language in there? No, you're, you're, you're exactly right about the two Goliaths. I hadn't thought that was a, that's a wonderful analogy. It is the ratepayer against both the purchaser and the seller of the utility. Um, and that does add to the complication. Um, I, look, the OPA is going to go hard at any reorganization that's proposed. We are going to look, turn over every stone we can. And this legislation doesn't hurt. It, it, uh, and that's why I'm neither for nor against. But I don't want to leave the impression that because of this legislation, I'm going to go do an even more thorough job of exploring the reorganization. Look, I, the, there are all, they come in all sizes and shapes. As Wayne Jortner discussed earlier, Fairpoint was not a foreign corporation or a foreign government. It was a disaster. And whether or not we could have figured that out, and if you go back further in history, some of the owners that have been the most controversial have been right here in Maine. They've been Maine citizens. Senator Richard Berry, if we go back far enough in history, some of you may remember those cases went to the Maine Supreme Court. It was a battle between uh, Senator Berry and the PUC over his holdings of various utilities. Um, General no, Water. No relation, just for the record. Sorry to yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad for that clarification. Uh, um, but he was also the chair of this committee when he was in the, involved in it. So it, it, there's a wonderful history there. But even General Waterworks, you know, a, a, a Philadelphia corporation had lots of controversy as to whether or not their ownership of, I think, at one point, 20 odd main water companies was uh, serving ratepayers. So we find them in all sizes and shapes. And whatever the purchaser is, will get aggressive and careful scrutiny from this office. And that's why I'm neither for nor against, because I don't think this is going to change the extent to which we, we do that. You all set, Representative Grahowski? Okay. Uh, Representative Sachs, do you have a question? Thank you, Madam Chair. And you may have just answered this, Mr. Harwood. I was listening and I took uh, Wayne Jordner, not just because he's from Freeport, but the 23 years of experience. And you, you noted that and saying he was a successful advocate, but he is saying based on that experience that he feels that this is necessary. What I'm hearing from you is, eh, it wouldn't hurt, but it's not really necessary. Is that still your testimony? Just, I, I fe felt like you had contradicted yourself just a wee bit. In that. I, I hope I haven't. Uh, uh, I, no, I am strictly neither for nor against. I, I don't think this bill is necessary. It's well-intentioned and I have no problem. I'm not opposed to it. It is well-intentioned, but my point is that I will, and I think uh, Mr. Jortner it would say that he would aggressively represent ratepayers before any reorganization, whether or not LD 697 was enacted into law or not. That is really my point, that I am going to be there aggressively representing ratepayers. And there's all sorts of things out there. I think one of the things you touched on with Mr. Jortner is size. You know, it, if Maine is being swallowed up by a massive international holding company, that creates risks, whether that massive international holding company is headquartered in Boston, Massachusetts, or Madrid, Spain, um, that creates risk in and of itself in size. Um, the NMAX acquisition had a different uh, issue. That was not the size. NMAX is about the size of CMP, so it wasn't a massive conglomerate. What we had there and what I think the PUC and, Mr. and the chairman were getting at there is it created an interesting and new issue as to how to calculate the uh, return on equity where the parent company was a municipal corporation that arguably had access to capital at very favorable terms and how that should be uh, 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 factored into the equation. Okay. So each one is different. Each one poses its own risks and its own challenges and we will be there for the ratepayers. And I don't know that the foreign government it is any worse, uh, or it, it, it is necessarily any worse than some of the other risks. Thank you.
I was over Telly, you are muted. I'm the problem. Yeah. Sorry, I was calling on Representative Foster and wondering why he was not going forward with his question because he couldn't hear me. Please. Uh, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I couldn't read your lips. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Public Advocate Howard, for being here today. Uh, a couple of questions, if I may. First of all, uh, I read your testimony uh, before I received the uh, sponsor's amendment to this. And I just want to confirm that your testimony is addressing not the original bill, but the amendment uh, that uh, we have before us. That is correct, Representative Foster. I, I was in, in possession of the amendment before I drafted my testimony. Uh, thank you. Uh, if I may, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, it, so with that amendment, uh, uh, well, first of all, I, I'd just like to say my first question, I think you've already touched on uh, through your response, responses to earlier uh, questions in that whether this is a foreign entity or a uh, U.S. Uh, uh, corporation that we're talking about for any takeover, any of these utilities, uh, it sounds like you feel that the, uh, uh, the Goliath, uh, as uh, Representative Grahowski referred to, still is there uh, or could be in, in some circumstances. For example, Fairpoint and telecommunications, that type of thing. And, and that the PUC, uh, even though they may do uh, due diligence, uh, may not foresee problems uh, with either of those uh, uh, companies or, or foreign or domestic ownerships uh, when, when something like this is occurring. Is that kind of the gist of what your responses were in that regard? Well, I think you've raised a slightly different point. I think you've got most of it, but I think the point you, you also raise is we can't always predict how these reorganizations are going to turn out. What we try and do is put conditions to the approval, if that's the appropriate way of addressing them, and then work on those conditions and make sure that they do address them. But at the end of the day, Representative Foster, I think what you put your finger on is, who, regardless of who holds the shares of stock in Versant Power or CMP, and I don't really, you know, it, 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 it's regardless of who holds it, I am gonna hold those two utilities accountable under Title 35A. They are going to, make sure their rates are just and reasonable and make sure that their service is safe, adequate and reliable. And I will be doing that. And so in some sense, once the reorganization is done, we will continue to regulate that utility. And there are all sorts of uh, owners that from time to time have owned main utilities. Some of them are passive, some of them are active. At the end of the day, I'm not as concerned about what they're thinking or what they're doing. I'm concerned what the management of the main utility is doing. And if I find fault with the management of the main utility, they will hear from me, regardless of what they're being told by their upstream investors. Uh, thank you. Uh, and if I may, uh, Madam Chair, thank you for restating my question better than I could. Uh, it, so in, in, in regards to the uh, amendment, uh, I know that you know the public advocate's office has got a little different uh, uh, charge, if you will, than the PUC certainly when dealing with something like this. But specifically to ratepayers and their interests, and, and uh, part of the language changes the uh, part of the amendment changes the language uh, to uh, look at uh, such a merger in regards to. Uh, whether or not the reorganization will result in a rate increase. And it now state the, the amended version states that it will result in lower rates. Uh, that seems along with a couple of other changes here uh, to uh, uh, what they uh, need to uh, look at as being uh, something that even if it's achievable, and I would suggest maybe we should add to this bill that the legislature will not pass any bill that raises ratepayer rates. Uh, but uh, that seems like a, a, a bit of an extreme to me to suggest that any merger going forward or any acquisition uh, with looking at renewable energy and so on and so forth, that we are going to suggest that we should make sure rates are actually lowered. In other words, if it's, if it's uh, rate neutral, so to speak, uh, that doesn't meet 
uh, this uh, uh, amendment language. Uh, I'm just wondering if you could, uh, look, if you've looked at that, how, what, if you agree, uh, how you think that would affect uh, not only the PUC, but especially your office and, and the charge that you have. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Foster. Yeah, I think what you're putting your finger on is, is this net uh, benefits versus no net harm. And, and this is just another version of that. And, and it is it, it could be problematic if for some if you if in a hypothetical you had the Ohio Teachers Pension Fund selling a main utility to the California Teachers Pension Fund, you would say we shouldn't care much and we shouldn't expect that rates will go down or service will go up. It's the same uh, utility. But the legislature in its wisdom said net benefits, and, and I respect that, and we will make sure that there are net benefits, even in a reorganization like that. And I think in some cases, the extent to which the rates will go down and the length of time the rates will go down may be relatively modest in a situation in which there isn't really a lot of other harm that needs to be offset by those benefits. But the law of the land is net benefits, and that's what we will insist on. And if it means lower rates, uh, is that's how you get to net benefits, so be it. Thank you. Further questions? Okay. Does any other member of the committee have a question for Mr. Harwood? Seeing none, thank, thank you, you for thank being you. with us. Thank, thank you. Forward to continuing this discussion. Um, and I think we are now joined by Deirdre Snyder from the PUC. And before Deirdre, you jump right in, let me just check with or ask Jason to be checking to see if there is still anyone in the waiting room who is interested in testifying neither for nor against. The, the only other person on my list is not in the waiting room, so. Okay, all right. So Deidre, you've got the uh, wrap up position here. I've been, I've been in the last position a lot here. <laughs> um, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Senator Vitelli, Representative Barry, and honorable members of the Joint Standing Committee on Energy, Utilities, and Technology. My name is Deirdre Schneider. I'm the Legislative Liaison at the Public Utilities Commission, here to testify neither for nor against the sponsor's amendment to LD 697 and act to reduce risks to main critical infrastructure on behalf of the Commission. The sponsor's amendment provided last week to make changes to the minimum factors the Commission must examine when determining if there are net benefits to ratepayers when a reorganization would result in the transfer of ownership and control of a public utility or the parent company of a public utility. The commission notes that the requirements to consider impacts on rates and local control are already in statute, and therefore the commission engages in this evaluation envisioned in the amendment. It is important to also note um, that these are the minimum factors the commission considers. Therefore, there are likely to be other factors the commission examines in these instances that would lead to a finding that there are net benefits to ratepayers, or conversely, there are no net benefits to ratepayers if this reorganization were to occur. The sponsor's amendment adds language regarding ownership or control by, of a utility by a foreign government, foreign corporation, or a subsidiary. It requires the commission to examine whether the reorganization will avoid the ownership or control in whole or in part of a public utility by a foreign government, a foreign corporation, or a subsidiary of a foreign corporation in a manner that could pose risks at any time to system reliability, customer privacy, or customer safety in the event of international hostilities. At the time the commission considers approval of a reorganization, it would, re it would determine whether there are any significant issues or risks regarding the proposed transaction and would deny the reorganization if significant risks exist. However, it is difficult to predict international circumstances that might develop in the future and how such developments may impact utility finances and operations. In the case of major international circumstances, the federal government would be the entity taking steps to address such circumstances, including the protection of the security of critical energy infrastructure. The commission does not think these changes are necessary. However, we do not see this amendment as posing a new burden on the commission, and it is generally workable. Um, I would be happy to answer any questions or bring back additional information for the work session. And I thank you for your time. Great. Thank you, Ms. Schneider. We always save the best for last, just so you know. Thank you. <laughs> questions for Ms. Schneider from the committee. Representative Foster. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you, for Ms. Schneider, for being here. The Senator stole my line, so I won't repeat it. But 
Uh, glad to have you here. Uh, you. I will, I'm not sure you heard the questioning I had for uh, the public advocate, but I'll ask you a similar question and, and in referring to the amendment to the original bill. Uh, and, and I'll stay away from the uh, foreign ownership portion that would be added to current statute, but the changes in statute, uh, I'm wondering if the PUC sees them as uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, going a little too far or, or causing the, uh, some issues with meeting them. Uh, the first would be that uh, the organization uh, will result in lower rates and the second an item uh, C2 would be that uh, the reorganization will result in a greater local control and improve the ability of local management to protect the interests. Uh, I'm wondering if you would comment to whether or not PUC sees them as being uh, more restrictive or too, too restrictive uh, beyond what statute all, already uh, requests and charges the PUC and allows the PUC to uh, consider. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I, I think you know it's important to note that these are the minimum um, factors that we have to consider in in these reorganization in instances. And so, you know, there could be an instance where maybe the reorganization would result in higher rates, but there's so many other benefits that we could find that there's a net benefit. Or conversely, that it would result in the lower rates, but maybe it would be you know greater control outside of the locality or something. So. I, we don't think it's too restrictive. I think we engage in a very similar sort of analysis already. And, and where these are minimums, there are there could be several other factors that we consider so that, you know, if you don't meet C1 or C2, it doesn't automatically mean that we have to deny the reorganization. Um, or if you do meet C1 or C2, it doesn't mean you automatically approve the reorganization. So as you know, you're looking at a big picture. These are our very case specific um, determinations. And so there may be other factors that we consider in our decision making. Follow up question? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and also, Ms. Schneider, uh, in, in, in looking at a reorganization, uh, and I'm looking at, uh, I guess, not only this statute, but, uh, but how law would see uh, the PUC, whether you're looking at a domestically owned corporation that uh, has, has put in a reorganization plan for uh, purchase of any of our utilities in the state. As far as I know, these utilities are, even though uh, some are regulated monopolies, they still are independent uh, companies, if you will. Uh, and I'm wondering, is there room there for the PUC to discriminate against uh, a company, say from the other side of the border in Canada uh, putting in a reorganization plan for purchase of one of these utilities versus a domestic uh, company. Uh, is that, do you see that a, as a legal issue that uh, this may in fact uh, uh, step over, if you will? Thank you. Thank you. So I just want to make sure I, I get your question. So are you saying the addition of C3 on um, looking at, you know, how it would impact if it's foreign ownership may be discriminatory against that foreign ownership versus if it's, you know, another domestic um, entity proposing it. So we're not looking at the same things to say, you know, if somebody from Pennsylvania is proposing a reorganization, we're not necessarily looking at those reliability issues or that. Is that, is that what your question is, just to be clear? Well, I, pretty much you're there. It's, it's more That's about the constitution, constitutionality of uh, the PUC having that uh, uh, privilege, if you will, to discriminate between a foreign company yeah. uh, in, in, say, Canada or a uh, uh, domestic company that's put in a proposal. Thank you. I'll answer this as I'll get back to you if I have some further guidance or somebody has a different opinion. But I, I'll, I'll say that I think, you know, as it's drafted, it's not saying that we have to deny it because it's foreign. We're just looking to say if they're foreign we're wanting to make sure that 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 ownership doesn't pose a risk or impede the ability of the commission to exercise its powers or duties. I think if it was written a little differently, maybe like had Mr. Jortner suggested, you know, it would be an automatic finding if there was foreign ownership that that that, that would be adverse. I don't know if that would raise particular issues. I would have to look into that further. So I, on its face, I'm not sure. 
um, if that raises to the way it's written is rises to the level of being sort of a discriminatory provision. Um, because again, it, it, it's a minimum and it's not saying that we have to find that the reorganization cannot occur simply because they're foreign. It's just, we have to examine these pieces to ensure that, you know, that our ratepayers are protected. But like I said, I will come back. I, I will definitely ask that question with our legal team just to ensure um, that they agree with that analysis. And if they have a different answer, I'll bring it back to the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Sachs, you have a question? Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks for being here, Ms. Schneider. Thank I just you. want to clarify because the language in the amendment and from the proponents arguments are for, is saying that this isn't just something that you can do right now. Your, state, your testimony, which I read prior, said that this is in statute already. We already taken these factors. What this um, bill uh, proposes to do, from my understanding and listening this morning and reading the testimony, is it's a more affirmative and instructive um, set of circumstances. So that in one of the most impactful saying that the PUC's evaluation will result it, that part of your assessment has to be, will this lower rates, not just will it result in an increase, but will it lower rates? Will it result in greater local control? So that would be a, an affirmative factor in your assessment. And then also that there's this foreign component. So there's actually three parts of it. And are you saying that the PUC doesn't mind or would this change your assessment or is it just make work? because it feels to me like this is more of a directive as opposed to what's currently in statute per your testimony. Um, thank you for that question. I mean, I, I obviously it is more directive because it provides more specificity, but again, like I stated earlier, the, the way the statute was originally structured, there were minimums that we had to look at. So they were, we had, we had discretion in looking at a whole universe and a whole suite of potential things. So we weren't precluded from looking at these things. Um, we could look at those things under the current law. We do look at rates. Maybe we didn't look at it in the context of the way it's written. You know, it says now that it would result in a rate increase, but we would look at that rate question currently under the current law of what will this do to rates? What will that do to local control? And, and make a determination is, does all those factors together result in a net benefit? If so, reorganization is to occur. If it doesn't, reorganization will not occur. So yes, it's, it is more directive. Obviously it has more things that we're supposed to look at this, this, and this, including whatever else we think is important to look at. So, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that um, it necessarily creates more work. I wouldn't say that, um, you know, it changes the game that much. That's why I think we think it's workable. We're not hundred percent sure it's necessary because it is, it is minimums. And so we can consider lots of factors. Right, and if I can just clarify, Madam Chair, for one second, is, is, it, is it that these now will hold more weight within that rubric or um, because again, I think it's a significant change about whether it will lower rates or whether it will be just an increase, a rate mm -hmm. increase. So if you're saying affirmatively that X plan would lower rates regardless of some of these, does that put it higher in your rubric of assessment if it's in statute like this, those three sections? I would, I will come back if there's, again, the caveat answer. Um, I'm not sure there's, you know, necessarily a rubric that if you meet one that has more value to it than if you meet something that we determine outside of the scope of the statute, or if you meet two, you know, there, I, I don't think these are valued in a way that you have to, you know, this has more weight than this way. We're, we're looking at a big picture and we're assessing all the parts of that picture to say at the end of the day, taking all these components, including these things in statute, and whatever else we look at, would that reorganization result in a net benefit? So I don't think there's a, a weight value to certain things. I think this is just instructive. As a minimum, we have to consider these three, three things. These are important things to consider, but there, there's many factors in, in these determinations. It's, it's not quite so, you know, a couple of points of, of a matter. I, I mean, I think there's a lot of factors that are considered when we're looking at these warrior organizations. So I don't want to say there's a a higher weight because this is written here that way. Um, but it is instructive that obviously the legislature wants us to look at this and it's important to evaluate these things in, in the context of reorganization where there's a change in ownership. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, Representative Barry. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, and um, Deirdre, uh, thank you for your comments on this bill. I um, I wanted to share what I what I hope to accomplish with um, C1 and C2 because uh, that's been talked about a lot here. That the low you know rate increases to lower rates um, and loss of contr local control versus greater local control. Um, my intent with that language was really just to better reflect really it's, it's it's more grammatical than anything else it's it's to better reflect that our change um it, it to a net benefit standard is meant to shift it from from not no lack of negative to presence of positive right so so um that was really all that i was trying to accomplish with with that portion of it just you know putting things in in a positive frame rather than a negative frame but at the end of the day it doesn't i i I didn't intend to change how the commission would would work. Uh, you know that those sections of law, uh, those those basic uh, uh, standards that they have to examine and consider in determining that benefit. So, um, given that that was my intent, would you say that uh, that that this language is in is in keeping with that intent? In other words, that that it's um, it's it's a it's a shift that. Um, from you know that that essentially um, just reflects the net benefit, and the determination of whether the rates are going to go up or down is just a, is just another factor that you're going to consider anyway. Yeah, yes, I would agree. I mean, I think we're looking at rates. Will they go up? Will they go down? Okay, mm -hmm. we have that check mark of what we do in analysis. Okay, we're going to look at all these other pieces as well, yeah. and sort of determine if if overall there is a net benefit or not. So I don't. Mm -hmm. I don't think that one and two result in a dramatic change to how we do things. And I think that was part of sort of the, the our testimony of, you know, it's not 100% necess necessary because we sort of engage in these already and it's not really changing what we do. Um, it's just being more instructive in some sense. Thank you very much. Any further questions for Ms. Snyder from the committee? Seeing none, thank you for thank being you. with us. Um, and Jason, just check one last time if there's anyone left in the waiting room who wishes to te testify in either for or against, uh, or for or against this legislation. Madam Chair, if I may, I, I have yes. received a, a message from uh, uh, the, the Dr. Gordon Weil, the, the uh, Maine's first public advocate, that he is unable to join us uh, regrettably, but um, wishes to direct our attention to his written testimony. Great. Thank you. Yes, Thank I you saw much. that in the uh, list. Don't know if anybody else is present. We always can go back and look at what's submitted as written testimony because we do indeed encourage people to submit written testimony. So Jason, one last check. Anybody still waiting? I, I don't see anyone and I don't see any hands. Okay. Then I would say that we have completed the public hearing on LD 697 and I apologize. I don't have the proposed amended new title but the existing title and act to enhance the energy security of Maine residents is now closed. Wonderful, and thank you so much, Senator Vitelli, for chairing uh, that public hearing and uh, members of the committee for um, sticking with it. Uh, we are just about at 11 o'clock and scheduled to um, take up additional business at 11.30. So this is a, a, a great time for our morning break. And um, if, if folks wanna go until 11.30 that, uh, for, for a, a little, um, break and, and possibly caucuses, if you wish to do that, that would make some sense to me. Uh, uh, any, any discussion or feedback on that? Uh, Representative Wadsworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just looking for some clarity on what legislative meeting means on the budget item discussion. Are we working it or? Um, Thank you. And um, we do need to provide some feedback uh, to the Appropriations and Financial Affairs Committee. Um, so my thinking is that we take that up at 11.30, um, give the committee a break. It is past our 
usual uh, nap time and um, uh, make sure that we do dispense with that important work before proceeding to the rest. Uh, Lindsay, do you have any uh, concerns about doing things that way? Nope, sounds good because we do have individuals here from um, Efficiency Main Trust and Office of Advocate Governor's Energy Office. So just wanted to clarify. Great. Uh, if folks would prefer, we can we can certainly shorten the the break right now. Just keep it to fifteen minutes, and then take a longer lunch break. But um, I uh, I don't see any major objections to going till eleven thirty. So why don't we do that? If folks um, are uh, have any need to caucus, I would definitely encourage checking in, and uh, that'll make the afternoon more efficient as well. So. Very good. Uh, let's uh, turn off our video and audio and, and uh, see you back here at 1130. Thanks.
Okay, welcome back. And uh, folks could turn their video on again. That'd be great. We'll be diving into supplemental budget work. Okay, and this is a continuation of a meeting. So um, I'm not concerned about quorum. I think when if it comes to a vote, then we'll need a quorum at that point. But uh, in the interest of time, um, Lindsay, can you um, orient us as to our, uh, our, our duties with respect to the supplemental budget? Absolutely. Um, so there was a joint public hearing on the elements of the budget that sort of touch on EUT on 4th. Um, and I sent around this morning the materials associated with the budget for discussion. So I figured what I would do is share my screen. We would walk through um, each initiative and we've got representatives, we've got Efficiency Main Trust, the Governor's Energy Office and the Office of the Public Advocate all have budget items. Um, so it's, you know, there's only three on here. So it's kind of up to the committee how you wanted to proceed. But essentially what you'll have to do is vote for whether you want this, you recommend for this to be included in the budget. Um, so it's something we could do one at a time um, or do it all at once. Um, it's up to you. And I will be handling uh, the telling of the votes for this. So why don't we do each item separately just in case there are objections on any uh, particular item or differences of opinion. Excellent. All right, so if you're ready, I'll share my screen. Great. Okay. So please let me know if you can see my screen. Yes. Okay, so let's start with Efficiency Main Trust. Um, so this initiative provides one-time funding to support electric vehicle rebate programs, including incentive programs. Um, this is a $7 million allocation. Uh, this initiative supports electric vehicle rebate programs, including incentive programs. Funding is a one-time transfer of the general fund unappropriated surplus. Efficiency Main Trust calculates that currently available funds in this program will be fully expended by the summer of 2022. I am gonna scroll through to the last page. So here we have the associated language. Um, notwithstanding any provision of law to the contrary on or before June 30th, 2022, the state controller shall transfer $7 million from the unappropriated surplus of the general fund to the efficiency main trust, um, other special revenue funds to account to support electric vehicle rebate programs, including incentive programs. We'll scroll back up. And I believe if the committee has questions, Michael Stoddard is available. Okay. Are there, that, yep. Are there questions from the committee for Mr. Stoddard? I know many of you were able to attend last Friday, which is great. <clears throat> we did talk about this at that point. Okay. Uh, seeing none, Lindsay, why don't we move on to the next? We'll come back and vote individually on these items, but uh, I want to make sure that we do have a senator at that time. Understood. Okay. Bear with me. I will share my screen again. Okay. So next up is the Governor's Energy Office. Um, First initiative continues and makes permanent one limited time public service coordinator two position previously continued by financial order. I won't read the number. Um, the justification this initiative continues and makes permanent one limited time position uh, to provide a director of the governor's energy office. The director is a key member of the GEO and will provide support and administration of a federal grant awarded by the Department of Commerce. This position will continue to develop an offshore Wind Economic Roadmap for the State of Maine. And then in the second initiative, um, continues and makes permanent one limited time public service coordinator two position previously continued by financial order. I'll skip the number. This initiative continues and makes permanent one limited time position to provide a solar and storage analyst in the governor's energy office. This position provides solar and storage policy as a component of Maine's clean energy economic future and manages resources to the benefit of Maine ratepayers. Funding for this position is provided by a grant from the United Nations Foundation. 
I'll scroll back up a little bit so you can see the dollar amounts. So for each initiative, it's $139,116. And I'll pause here. Does anyone have any questions for me? Um, and I believe that um, Mr. Burgess is here as well. See no questions for Lindsay. Um, I do have a question for Dr. Burgess. So um, Jason, if you could bring him in, that would be great. Welcome. And uh, Good did, did you have an, an initial comment? I, I think I saw your hand up, so I just wanted to make sure to recognize you if, if so. Okay. I, was just, I was just making sure that yeah, I, I could be seen in the Zoom world for. Good idea. Um, <laughs> Director Burgess, my question goes to um, the, uh, the existence of other bills in other committees that may um, impact your budget. And those could be potentially, you know, dealt with off the table uh, if necessary. But I just wonder, you know, if the, just for the committee to kind of have the big picture, uh, can you speak to any other legislation that might require uh, additional appropriations for the GEO? Thanks, thanks, Chair Bear. I'm, I'm happy to. Some of it is obviously speculation, given that a lot of the committee work is even happening parallel to this one. As you know, there's a um, uh, a bill related to uh, um, uh, ag and solar overlap um, that I think right now appears to potentially have a, a position for our office related to um, tracking and creating a, a database to to better track kind of where energy projects are where they exist and the potential impacts to, um, or, you know, kind of what, what, what land they're on. Um, so that is one. Then there's, there are other bills. Um, uh, um, well, that's the one that comes to mind, I guess, in other committees. I think um, for, for this committee, there's, you know, we're going to talk about Northern Maine um, this Thursday. And if, if additional, you know, analysis or focus is, is desired by, by the committee is, it could be a question. Um, so those those are the two that come to mind, and I guess the third would be any potential additional funding that may be needed if there's um, additional analysis for the distributed generation group. Um, um, but those are the three that that come to mind most for me right now. That is very helpful, and I believe ACF is voting on uh, that solar siting and land use bill today, or at least it's on their agenda for work session. So. Um, depending on where that goes, if that comes out <clears throat> unanimous, but then it needs to be funded off the table, um, it makes that work a lot harder to accomplish. So, you know, I just, I guess, you know, I wanted to make sure the committee was aware of uh, the existence of that. And, you know, I, I, uh, full disclosure, I'm the sponsor of that bill. So, <laughs> you know, we, we, we may or may not want to weigh in on it, but I think the importance of that legislation um, which the, I've been working on with uh, both the GEO and also the Department of um, Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry and other groups is, is the, the land use impacts uh, of our energy infrastructure as we make the transition to clean energy, the um, support for municipalities that are trying to figure out how to uh, you know, create municipal ordinances that address this new reality um, the sort of overlay of mapping of grid infrastructure and existing energy projects, proposed energy projects, uh, soil types, you know, what's prime farmland, what's not, um, you know, where do we have brownfields, where is there uh, evidence of PFAS contamination, you know, all of these things are uh, included in that work and it's pretty complex and I would suggest pretty important as well. As we make this transition, so I think if that committee, you know, if 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 the ACF committee decides to report that bill out and and recommend this position, this this additional work uh, or funding rather for the for the GEO that would be um, that would be entrusted with that work, the committee might want to flag its opinion, its maybe its general opinion about the importance of that 
funding in uh, its letter to appropriations. And there may be other things. I, you know, I, I guess I didn't hear um, too much that's not coming from our committee anyway. <laughs> uh, but I just wanted to make sure to flag that um, for our consideration. Any other uh, thoughts or questions for Dan? Okay, so Lindsay, if the committee, um, I mean, the committee has a number of, of uh, options pertaining to this item, uh, the GEO uh, budget, we can uh, recommend that it be approved as submitted. We can recommend that it be um, approved with less money attached, or we can recommend that it be approved with more money attached. And that uh, those positions can also be contingent on the passage of other legislation. So I just wanted to flag that and, you know, I want to, I want to suggest that we we consider the nuances of our uh, of our letter, our advisory letter to ACF. Uh, excuse me, to AFA. Any other discussion on this item? And we will come back to it because uh, we're going to go through each of them and then vote uh, individually, as I mentioned earlier. Okay, let's go on to the next item. Okay. And. Thank you, Director Burgess, by the way. Okay, last item is the Office of the Public Advocate. Mm -hmm. This initiative establishes one Office Specialist One position to bring the staffing level to 10 employees as authorized in Maine Revised Statutes 35A, Section 116, Subsection 8, and provides funding for related all other costs. Mm -hmm. um, so that is $87,000 um, with that. I'll stop sharing my screen on this one. Um, I did want to flag for the committee. There was a question um, at the public hearing with AFA about this specific initiative and whether um, whether it had been voted on um, and that this was excluded from the budget um, based on a AFA vote. Um, so that's why why it was not included back in June. So thank and you. I and it sounded like that vote may have been inadvertent. Um, um, the yes, no. Um, the AFA affirmatively voted to not include this in the budget. Ah, got it. So it was voted on. Okay. I see. Mr. Harwood is here and can certainly speak to this further. Yep. Great. All right. Questions for Mr. Harwood? Anybody want to ask anything of him? He did speak to it last Friday. Okay. Seeing no. Representative Sachs. Yeah, actually, I was just checking my notes off screen because there was a lot of papers flying around. It, I, I have it written down as it was inadvertently left off. And so, Lindsay, you're saying now that that's not true? That is, that is not, it was not inadvertently, let, well, it was vote, it was not included in the budget because there was an affirmative vote to not include it. Okay. So that is different than we heard at the public hearing from the advocate. Do we That's want to correct. bring in the advocate and ask? Sure, we can do that. And uh, while Mr. Harwood is coming in, I, I do want to just um, share that uh, in, in my almost 14 years now in the legislature, it's sometimes hard to tell whether a vote is, is uh, inadvertent or not. <laughs> right. That's fine. Uh, but, but my understanding is, if I could, it, Lindsay, if I can confirm with you prior to Mr. Harwood being in here, is the on the papers that we have, it says that it brings to staffing levels to 10 employees as authorized in the statute. So it sounds like, and I can confirm this, Mr. Hardwood, since you're here, it sounds like you are asking for this position to be included to bring this staffing level up to what is authorized, but that this may not be an inadvertent move, it was a, an affirmative move. Yes, thank you, Representative Sachs. Uh, you, the way you describe it is exactly right, and I want to apologize to the committee. Um, the word inadvertent was probably um, not the best choice of words. It was inadvertently used as, <laughs> in this case. Um, I, we don't know what the motivation was. I'm told by my uh, from my predecessor, public advocate Hobbins, that there was apparently some hope, expectation, or understanding that the position would get authorized and when the final budget was voted out, it was not. Uh, far be it from me sitting here today to uh, suggest what the motives were for that vote. Um, 
So I apologize for the, the confusion that we created, but we do need that 10th position. It was something that we hope to have before and we're hoping now to have. And so that person can uh, join us this summer and start representing ratepayers. Great, any other questions, Representative Sachs? Other questions or discussion? Yeah, I'll, I'll just say that um, you know, as the committee knows, this uh, funding does not come from the general fund, and it's always a little puzzling to me. Um, you know what what goes on at the appropriations committee with respect to to, to you know this world, uh, our, our the world we live in. But um, you know whatever did happen over there last June, I am very very convinced that. Uh, whether you're up against one Goliath or two, or who knows, maybe three, um, it's pretty important to have a public advocate. And I'd like there to be some robust staffing there. So I'll certainly be voting to approve this item. I strongly Thank recommend you. Thank you. that it be continued. Other discussion? All right, seeing none. Thank you, Mr. Harwood. And Lindsay, uh, anything else in the supplemental budget? You're muted. It's bound to happen at some point. Um, there's nothing else. So if the if there's more discussion, if the committee wants to vote, just let me know. Great. We hope to be rejoined by a senator. Uh, senator Vitelli apparently has lost both internet and power. And I think she's on the phone with uh, the, the, the electrical utility for Rousick at this moment to try to figure out what ha what's happening. So she won't be able to uh, join us to vote. So uh, the only thing that we can do with these items, having discussed them uh, and without a Senator is to table. And at this time I'd be happy to entertain a tabling motion. So moved. It's been moved to table by Representative Wadsworth. Is there a second? Seconded by Representative Kessler and all those in favor of tabling. Okay. All right, it's unanimous. So uh, the supplemental budget will, will be tabled. Uh, it's good to have it kind of uh, all on the table, so to speak, in terms of the, the issues um, and the possible um, decisions of the committee. And with that, uh, we have a number of work sessions scheduled for this afternoon. And again, we're able to continue discussing bills. We just can't vote on them until we have a, at least one senator or the uh, approval of the president of the Senate to go ahead and vote. And um, I think I will ask our committee clerk to just uh, let the president of the Senate know that we are without a senator and it would be helpful to have that permission. Jason, do you have the number? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll let them know. Great. Thank you so much. And we'll move forward. Um, the, the bills, how are they advertised? Uh, Lindsay, which bill do we have listed first? Let me take a look. So on the website, they're showing up as LD170 followed by 1079. These may just be um, Numerical order though, 170, 1079, 1202, and then 1587. Great. And the uh, the bill, I, I do believe that there's been some, some work done by sponsors or other parties on a few of these. Uh, so I think it would be helpful to hear from uh, those individuals who, you know, whether it's the sponsor or someone else has been working on the bills. Um, the, uh, the one that I think might be easiest to take up at this time and to, uh, oh no, sorry, we can't vote. <laughs> I don't wanna take up the easy ones because we, we left a vote on them. Um, let's take up a hard one. Uh, so, I would love to know, Representative Wadsworth, are, are, would you be willing to give us an update on 1202 and we could just briefly go into work session on that and 
see how far we can get with it. Only if Rep. Grahowski will join me. Okay, Representative Grahowski, is that a deal? All right, she's, that's a thumbs up. So uh, the chair will lay before the committee LD 1202 and uh, begin by recognizing the sponsor to give us any update that he has. Yeah, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, we had a lot of great feedback from the work session, if you can recall, and was that a week ago today, I think? And um, afterwards, Rep. Grahowski, Grahowski contacted me and just had a few concerns and thought we could make the bill better. So I put her in contact with the main forest products council. And uh, if she could actually highlight um, what, what they kind of accomplished over the last four days, it would be great. Thank you, Representative Wadsworth. Uh, Representative Grahowski, over to you. Um, thank you so much. And special thanks to uh, Representative Wadsworth for encouraging me that the ideas had some merit and that I ought to pursue them and putting me in touch with Mr. Strauch. Um, I guess, uh, so there is some language that has been sort of circulated between those parties and the governor's energy office to take a look at, but um, <clears throat> I don't think we have that. Uh, I don't think it's, I'm not sure if Lindsay has received that or not. So what I could do is just let you guys know verbally what the changes are, um, if that makes the most sense. And then just explain um, why they're there and what the intent was to accomplish them. Um, so <clears throat> the, I guess I would say the, uh, the changes sort of um, surround this question of how can we um, design this policy to meet one of the goals that I heard a lot about, which was um, making sure that manufacturing residuals are sort of going to their highest and, and best use to create energy through a CHP program or um, facility <clears throat> rather than going to the landfill or maybe being burned in a less efficient way. So, um, and additionally, efficiency of the units was a thing that was discussed, I think, amongst some members. And the third thing was um, trying to ensure that this was in line with the Climate Action Plan, because this was a recommendation of the Energy Working Group, and it is in the Climate Action Plan, but there was um, some specificity within the Energy Working Group that didn't make it through the plan that we wanted to try to incorporate here as well. So that's sort of the overarching picture of what we were trying to accomplish in the conversations and the outcome. Um, and Lindsay, don't worry too much about taking notes on what goes where, cause it is written, <laughs> but I'll just share with, with you all um, <clears throat> the general concept. Uh, we, in the, the part where we say why the program is established, we added language to emphasize that this is in support of the climate action plan, the 2020 plan, so that the PUC will keep in mind that that is sort of where the source of this was from. <clears throat> um, in the section on program eligibility criteria, that currently includes that the that is at the baseline that the CHP unit must be connected to the grid, must have an in-service date after October 1st, 2021. That I don't know if we want to change. I think Lindsay maybe had flagged that for us, but uh, so that's what's in there right now, as well as um, satisfying the, the limits that there <clears throat> must be between three and 10 megawatts. Um, and what we've added to that is that either these would be installed in a new manufacturing facility or designed to be more efficient per unit of energy produced than the plant that is being replaced. So the idea is that we are trying to lock in higher efficiency than what we have now in the case that this is a, a transition for uh, an entity to switch to CHP. Um, so that's sort of the, the baseline that we're setting around efficiency <clears throat> uh, for the program. And then the final set of changes is in um, the section on the commission's considerations when looking at bids for this program. And I think um, you might recall, since it was only a week ago, although it feels like longer, um, I had some questions around, was there a way to structure this section to help the PUC determine which of these criteria were more important to us for this program? And so I worked with um, Forest Products uh, to basically split this into three buckets. So the considerations are essentially what you've seen already. 
but now they are split into a 30% weight toward efficiency, um, a 40% weight toward the total cost of the project, and then the other factors are grouped together at 30% weight. And the reason that we did this was because we believe that um, this will help the PUC choose projects that are economically and energy efficient as a, a top priority, an overarching priority, giving those together 70% of the score. And then the, the final change within this is that in order to really emphasize that we would like to see waste reduction um, and diversion happening, we've added a sentence under other factors that the PUC should consider the design of the project to meet the state's waste reduction and diversion priorities, um, probably with a cross-reference to Title 38, um, including but not limited to the proximity of the project to the wood fuel derived from manufacturing residuals. And the point of that is that we would really like to see these facilities located where the waste streams are because that will, I mean, I think that's what will happen anyhow because that would be the most economically efficient, but we just wanted to make sure the PUC understood that part of the reason for this program is really that diversion of, of uh, manufacturing residuals into a CHP program or, or, or facility. <clears throat> so those are, those are the, um, the changes that we came up with after a lot of discussion and certainly a lot of learning on my part, there are parts that I had wanted to adjust, but as I understood implications of that more, I thought that these were um, better policy solutions to uh, you know, allow these facilities to have access to materials they might need to be economically viable and adjust their, um, their production, production of energy based on what's changing for their uh, fuel sources, for instance. And I, I think a little bit of flexibility where I was myself being a little more rigid does make sense to me. So this is where I'm not gonna bring you all through the thought process and the learning process, but this is what, um, what I've come up with and, and discussed with others who have a little more knowledge about CHP than I do. So um, I had fun with it. I thank you all for the additional time to let me <laughs> explore some of these ideas and to Rep Wadsworth for um, encouraging that as well. Thanks for listening to my long uh, preamble here. Great, your, your input was absolutely appreciated and it's a more refined and targeted bill with the further work. So thank you, Nicole. Great, nice to see some movement towards, uh, towards an agreement here. Um, and uh, is there discussion or questions for either the sponsor or Representative Krahowski. Uh, Representative Kessel. Just a quick question. Is, is there like a written changes that you could share with us? Anyone wanna take that? Well, I guess I would say I, I do have like a written version and I think it's the one that we have consensus on. Yeah. Um, but I don't know if I'm allowed to screen share or if I should just email it over to Lindsay and she can show it really quickly. And why don't you go ahead and uh, email it to the analyst? Okay, I'll do That'd that. Great. I'm a very visual learner. And while, while we're waiting, waiting for a senator, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, we may have a senator at least by phone shortly, but uh, I'm working on it. Representative Foster. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. If I may, while we're uh, utilizing this time, uh, I believe uh, Mr. Hudson is in attendance and I was wondering if I could pose a question to him uh, concerning possibly these changes and, and uh, uh, his earlier testimony on this. Yes, you may. Uh, Jason, could we bring in Mr. Hudson? Here it comes. All right, go ahead, Representative Foster. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chair Barry, and, and thank you, Mr. Hudson, for being here. In uh, uh, testimony, written testimony that the committee received on the original bill, uh, uh, Mr. Buxton, uh, I believe, uh, at least his name was on it, uh, stated that uh, he had great concerns with the uh, potential cost to ratepayers that this bill would would have and and I I have great concerns that any increase in 
rate payers' costs uh, need to be uh, looked at very carefully. However, my understanding, there are a couple of changes, uh, one of which is, a, as I understand it, a cap of 10 cents maximum per kilowatt hour placed in this bill. And also potentially some of the changes that Representative Grahowski just discussed uh, that have occurred that may uh, uh, put to rest some of the concerns that uh, Mr. Buxton voiced in his uh, testimony. I'm wondering, if you have a, a, any uh, thoughts now on what we hope to see before us here shortly, uh, that the new amended version looks like, uh, you know, uh, I'd appreciate any help you can offer me there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Representative Foster. Um, for those listening online, I am Stephen Hudson. I'm an attorney with Purdy Clarity. I'm here today speaking on behalf of the Industrial Energy Consumer Group. And in fact, we did oppose this bill as printed because of those very reasons that Representative Foster mentioned. Um, however, uh, we think that the uh, proponents of the bill and Representative Wadsworth have worked very uh, collaboratively with others to try to address the concerns that were raised at the hearing. Um, we, in addition to the, to the hard cap on the, on the uh, price, I think there was also um, the sponsors amendment that I saw had reduced the megawatt total megawatts in the program to a total of 20 instead of 50. And that's that, of course, lowers the cost significantly, the potential cost significantly. And I think that there are um, there are other elements in the bill in, in the sponsors amendment that give the PUC the ability to determine that any specific project is not in the public interest. And in fact, uh, if they decide that all of uh, the proposals that that might be received as a result of this bill don't meet um, their uh, their charge to find a determination of public interest, that those will be rejected and then they'll redo the RFP. I, I believe that's correct. Um, I appreciate the efforts of all parties, including uh, Representative Wadsworth and, and Representative Grahowski and, and the members of this committee and, and the proponents of the bill, including the Forest Products Council for their efforts to address concerns raised by, by others. If I may, Mr. Chair. Please go ahead. Uh, uh, Mr. Hudson, so in, the, in, in Mr. Buxton's original uh, testimony, uh, he raised great concern about uh, the uh, possibility or, or the likelihood that uh, any of these projects would have the capability of taking advantage of net energy billing, which, uh, as you may have heard in the past, I'm greatly concerned about costs to ratepayers that that would bring about. Uh, however, uh, as I understand it, this new language uh, in the bill may uh negate that or is that still a concern thank you thank you i have not seen the final language representative but i think that the fact that the, the uh, size limitations are three to three to ten megawatts would um and given what the, this committee did with ld960 last session would make it highly unlikely that any specific um proposal under this program would would, would enter into uh energy billing in fact um if they're if they're bidding in a contract with the PUC for a long-term contract, they're not going to be also able to enter into, into uh, NEB, uh, is my understanding. And finally, if I may, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Hudson, and, and this is uh, there may not be a clear answer to this, but my understanding with the cap that we're looking at, uh, this bill. Uh, Part of the original intent in writing it was to possibly offer these opportunities in, in some parts of Northern Maine. And, uh, but wherever they may uh, be placed, if, if they in fact were built, uh, it would seem that uh, most of the uh, renewable energy they are competing against, the actual kilowatt hour uh, cost of ratepayers for those other facilities, such as a wind uh, a wind project are going to uh, most likely be uh, greater than uh, what these plants would uh, would be allowed by the PUC. Is that am I correct in that? Well, it depends on what you're talking about because you're talking uh, in this case we're talking about um, in essence sawmill sized um, biomass uh, cogeneration projects. And as a, and and if you think about it, they're the, they're the in between between 
the small, what, what is now developing into the smaller NEB projects, certainly five megawatts or less, but I think what we're gonna see is an increasing number of those going forward are gonna be two megawatts or less as a result of LD960 last session. Um, and then um, and then comparing them to the grid scale, which you know hopefully are going to be larger. Maybe they're you know tw at least twenty, maybe thirty and or forty megawatt projects, and and those are the ones that especially in northern Maine that, that uh, the IACG believes that will be able to very uh, cost effectively provide renewable energy for Maine. Um, so I think that um, while you, we it's no secret to anyone who's watched IECG's position on this that we oppose the the uh, the pricing of NEB at what is now going to be close to 19 cents. Um, we think that that this this particular bill uh, does a lot of good things for the forest products industry, for rural manufacturing in general, and and, uh, and uh, I think it's very consistent with the goals that, that the Maine Climate Council set forward. Uh, uh, in, in its uh, uh, in its plan that it was submitted to the legislature and released by the governor. So, I so uh, am I am I to understand then that uh, the position that Mr. Buxton uh, conveyed to us in his earlier testimony has now changed? Yes, the IECG has switched its position from opposition to this bill to support of the sponsor's amendment as further amended by the discussions that. Uh, uh, that Representative Grahowski and Representative Wadsworth and the and the Forest Products Council have engaged in. Uh, we obviously would like to see the actual language, but but uh, what we heard sounds sounds good to us. Well, so would I. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Any other questions for Mr. Hudson or discussion with him? All right. Seeing none. Thank you, Mr. Hudson. Thank you. And uh, we will move on to uh, view the language. Uh, with the assistance of our analyst. Okay. Keeping Can in mind this uh, is a, a very rough uh, draft that the analyst has not had a chance to <clears throat> look over and put into more um, refined form. And I'm gonna recognize uh, Representative Krahowski in case she wants to comment on, on this language. Um, thank you, Chair Barry. I was just going to say exactly that, which is um, it has not been through the, um, the good process that Lindsay uh, does for us. And I, we didn't, I don't know if there were any kind of versioning issues or anything. So it's really only the things that are highlighted that are the changes that we need to look at to get integrated. Okay, we'll look at the highlights. And, and that would be for any, anything that was crossed out or added. Uh, correct. Yeah. Any changes from what um, Rep. Wadsworth proposed last Tuesday are in highlight. Great. Uh, do you want to walk us through this, the, those highlights briefly, um, just to sort of signal um, again what what you're doing in each of these places, or do you would you like to ask see if our analysts can do that? I'm, I'm happy to do it, just because I feel like it's unfair to ask Lindsay to do that if she hasn't seen it, like, right. but for a couple minutes. Um, and I'll do a much shorter version than what I just gave you. So the first part um, is just reiterating or, or emphasizing that this is related to the climate plan. I don't know that we can actually reference the climate plan in that way in statute. So I think that Lindsay will probably have a hand in, in fixing that reference to be appropriate, but that's what that is. Um, if you can scroll down. This is the addition and the program eligibility criteria of that. Um, sort of lower bar that we're setting for efficiency here um, in, in the new letter D that we that I discussed. And that language is adapted some from, um, sort of hard to figure out how to fit it in, but the energy working group had put forth some general language around comparing um, the plant to be replaced with the new facility. Um, at an existing facility. So we're trying to work that language into here. That's what happened with the letter D. And then <clears throat> the last part here, it's all highlighted um, because that was a restructure of this section, um, but the language for A and B are the same. And the only change within C is the addition of 
that content in letter A. So as I mentioned, we're divvying it up um, 30% for efficiency, 40% for cost, um, and then everything else is under an additional 30%. And so that first 1A is the only change, which is basically that reference to wanting to, you know, uh, preferring projects, all else being equal, that are using, that are following the waste management diversion priorities that we have in a different section of statute, aka the waste management hierarchy, and then adding that bit about, you know, the proximity of the location to the wood fuel for manufacturing residuals being a consideration. So that only, the only language change is in A, C, A. And I think that's it. Okay. Thank you, Representative Grahowski. Any questions from the committee on those changes? And Lindsay, just on at first glance, anything that uh, that you see as um, uh, requiring clarification in order to to uh, complete the drafting? No, I think what I would ask is if um, I'd like to have a little more time with it. Um, but I, if I can come back with any questions, you know, this, I mean, yep. nothing's jumping out at me. How about that? No problem. Great. Uh, just a reminder, if you are an attendee, um, since we're in work session, we generally don't bring you in. Um, I do see a hand raised. Um, you know, if, if a committee member wants to hear from a member of the public, any any interested party, we, we certainly will will ask for information from you. But we're unable to take um, additional unsolicited testimony at this time. However, you can submit written testimony uh, at the legislature.gov website and just go down to testimony at the bottom right of the screen. Representative Foster. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, I see that PUC is in attendance. I'm not sure that they've, I don't know how much purview they've had with this particular amendment and everything, but I would at some point like to know from them how, what they think of this, the changes that were made and, and uh, how it will affect or how they will be able to administer it. Thank you. Great idea. Uh, let's bring in Jason, uh, both Deirdre, Schneider and also uh, Mitch Tannenbaum. And Representative Foster, you wanna just uh, leave it with that open-ended question. Uh, what, what do they think? Or do you wanna put any finer point on it? Uh, I'm pretty good with that. What, what they think of uh, the, the bill as it currently stands as we understand it's been amended and uh, uh, how, how they, any concerns or, or uh, uh, other thoughts they may have on it. Thank you. Great. Uh, Deirdre, Mitch, up to you who uh, takes a stab at that first. Mitch, go ahead. <laughs> good, right. good afternoon, Representative Barry, members of the committee. This is Mitch Tannenbaum, I'm senior counsel with the PUC. Um, looking at the changes, I don't think it would affect the commission's ability to uh, do what's contemplated in, in, the, uh, in the amended bill. So I, I think our initial testimony still stands on, on that. Great. Any follow-up, Representative Foster? Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tannenbaum. I'm wondering if... Uh, you agree with uh, some of the opinion, I'll call it, that's been offered that uh, we won't, won't, we would not be likely to see any of these uh, uh, projects uh, fit in under the net energy billing uh, uh, process. Yeah, I think that's correct. Uh, building on what Steve Hudson said, given what the, where net billing is going, which I looks like two megawatts or less and, and under the bill we're talking three to five or three to ten I guess that uh, they wouldn't be able to uh, participate in both this uh, long-term contract process and net billing although I suppose that could be specified in the legislation just to be clear thank you great any other 
follow up, Representative Foster. Other questions uh, for the D, uh, for the PUC? Okay. So um, I guess I have a quick one. Just so um, if we were to clarify in this legislation, um, it appears to be relatively clear, but if we were to clarify that uh, net energy billing is excluded for this particular purpose, um, that would still leave open uh, participation in thermal racks, uh, sales of, of associated racks if those weren't part of the, of the, of the procurement that's envisioned here, uh, potentially other, uh, other uh, sources of added value, is that correct? Yeah, it would be similar to a solicitation for, let's say, solar projects where they can bid both energy capacity and RECs. And depending on our analysis, we might choose just to buy energy and let the sponsor sell the RECs on the market. Or we could decide to purchase the RECs and then the utility would actually purchase the RECs and sell it on the market. So I think it would work the same way. Great. And, and I apologize, I don't have the language in front of me, but um, this this cap, this price cap, um, does that apply only to energy as, as, as you read the amended language or does that price cap apply? Could, could a, under, under this language, could, could, could be accidentally being allowing a, a rec to be sold for nine cents, for example? That's a good question. I, um, I'd have to take another look, mm -hmm. but it specifies contract price for energy. Okay. okay. Cannot exceed 10 cents per kilowatt hour. Okay. So we wouldn't be purchasing their thermal recs or anything other than energy. So at the 10 cents, yeah, that makes sense. Great. Thank you. Other questions for the commission or discussion with them? Okay. Seeing none. Uh, oh, Representative Grahowski. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have a, a question that um, just sort of came to me that I hadn't thought of before. What if um, like all the bids come in right at, you know, 9.99 cents or something like that? Does the PUC have the discretion to say, you know what, we don't really think that was competitive. Please go back and try again. Or do you need to be given that discretion? Or what would happen in that case? Because competition, I think, is important to all of us. Right? Yeah, that, that's interesting, um, Representative, because it, it, this was is modeled to some degree on the community um, renewables project, which had a similar 10 cent cap. And I th think was limited maybe to 20, maybe more. And, you know, the bids do tend not necessarily 9.9, .9, but 9.8. <laughs> so, um, although, yes, and the direct answer to your question is if it looks like it's not competitive because we only got one bid, uh, I think under the uh, under the bill, the commission would have the authority and he's just nodding to say, no, it's not competitive. We're not gonna accept this. Although I don't think it would be based just on the fact that we only got one bid because the bidder wouldn't know how many bids we got. So, but I think we do have that authority, right, Deidre? Deidre, do you I mean, Sure, thank you, thank you. Um, and just, I guess I haven't said, I'm Deirdre Schneider, I'm with the PUC. Um, it does say in the bill, the amended language now, if at the close of the process, the commission determines that the proposal doesn't meet the requirements of the solicitation or that an approval is not in the public interest, the commission can reject all proposals and open a new competitive bidding process. So I assume if everything came in at 9.99% uh, sense, we might say that's not in the public interest and reject the bids and reopen. And that is close to what happened with the community renewables procurement, Mitch. I mean, the bids coming in. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm sure our reports on long-term contracts have the exact pricing, but we did accept the bids and I'd have to go back and look. I don't want to suggest they were all like 9.9 .9 or 9.8. Um, but we did it. We did accept the bids on on the grounds that they were, you know, reasonably competitive. Thank you. Uh, would you say that it, that there's a danger in setting uh, a ceiling in that respect? 
Uh, yes, although I'm not suggesting it's like anything else, Representative, you know, the pros and cons. Um, one con of setting a cap is what we're talking about. Bidders tend to bid really close to the cap. But um, of course, putting in a cap gives gives the uh, the committee the comfort that prices won't be above or the cost of the ratepayers won't be above a certain amount. Because if there was no cap, what if we got a 20 cent bid? Got it. Thank you. Other discussion for the PUC? Representative Foster. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So Mr. Tannenbaum, in, in, in the regard to a, a plant such as this, that's going to be a co-gen uh, wood product, uh, probably based uh, entity, Generally speaking, they are looking for uh, the opportunity to price energy at a uh, price that will uh, make their project viable, but yet be competitive. Their, their main source of income, I would hope, is their wood business, and whether it's a sawmill or, or what have you. It, 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 am I wrong there? Or In other words, what I'm thinking is that the, the bids that come in, they're not looking to make as much money as they can on the electric side of things but uh and, and therefore the bids may may be lower than what we might expect am i out, way yes. off there no i don't think so representative it's that that's the positive side of a competitive bid process so if it works as intended an entity would bid its lowest price to get the contract so we would look at all those factors Great. Any other discussion? Okay. So, oh, Representative Foster. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, as far as further discussion goes, it seems that it might be uh, in the committee's best interest to uh, have a chance to go over this uh, new bill, if you will, this amended version. Uh, and uh, to uh, come back in the future to possibly uh, have a motion and a vote once uh, some of us had a chance to look at, at it more closely and converse with any other interested parties that we may wish to, to verify that what we think we've got in front of us is actually what we have in front of us. Uh, if uh, the chair agrees, I think further action would be required. Uh, that is... That's something I'm open to, Representative Foster. I won't speak for others, but um, you know, obviously the committee could decide to table this uh, until Thursday, for example. Um, it seems like there's some good progress has been made, and um, perhaps that will um, lead us to a consensus, which would always be nice. The um, uh, the, the opportunity to, to speak with other stakeholders uh, that we have right now is, is attractive to me. I'm, I'm particularly interested in um, speaking, we're hearing from the DEP. Um, I see Stacy Knapp is here and uh, Jason, if you could call in Stacy Knapp, I don't know if others, I don't see others from the DEP, so looks like just Stacy. Are you able to bring in Stacy Knapp? Yep, yep. Oh, yep, she should be on her way. Okay, great. Fantastic. Thank you, uh, Stacy Knapp, for joining us uh, to, to represent the DEP. And I, I just want to start by thanking you for the follow up information that you provided through our analyst. Uh, I found it very helpful. Um, one point of clarification um, that I wanted to make is because I, we had heard from a, 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 an, one of the interested parties to the bill that uh, the residuals, uh, that a very significant portion of them were being landfilled. At least that's how I understood uh, that person's testimony 
you came back with a different uh, a different take on that. Can you just speak to that and also how you know how you um, how that's how that's measured and and uh, and verified? Um, I don't know exactly how it's verified. Um, so I looked at the the report that I linked to you guys last time, and that evidently does include any residuals from a mill that would go to a landfill. Um, and so I spoke with a number of people about this and they assured me that that was probably correct because mills do not want their residuals to go to landfill. And their assumption was that there's a fear that more would need to go to a landfill, but it's not going there right now. So right now they're my understanding is that there is a market for what is being produced now, but that there is not a market for anything above and beyond. And that that's the problem, that there is no additional market for residuals, but that it is being used right now, um, primarily um, burned as biomass. Got it, thank you. That's helpful. Um, I also had a question about uh, the DEP process for approving um, combustion, uh, you know, boilers. Uh, I realize that may not be exactly your wheelhouse. So uh, perhaps this is something if we do take a little more time for it, that, that you could help us to uh, learn more about. Certainly. My understanding is that the, so the question is, um, if I'm putting in a, a, a sizable CHP boiler at, at my sawmill, and uh, let's say, let's say that's, I don't know, three, you know, three megawatts. So it's, you know, it, it's not huge, but it's, it's, uh, it's not insignificant. Mm -hmm. Does that automatically trigger uh, chapter 115 approval processes at DEP? And if so, would that require uh, best available technology for efficiency of my boiler? So you are correct in that I do not know the answer to that, but I do know people who do. So yeah, I can look into that for you. Yep. Thank you. That's great. That's great. Any other questions for DEP or discussion? Representative Foster. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Knapp, for being here. The, so uh, in regard to your answer about the question about uh, landfilling uh, uh, residuals from, from mills, and, and it was my understanding that the concern is future development Right. Would, would be restricted and, and may require that. But also uh, my experience is that, especially from a sawmill where that, for instance, softwood sawdust is considered a uh, very valuable commodity to a pulp mill. Mm -hmm. uh, when one takes into account uh, the, the loss of that market, if you will, or the reduction in that market in the state of Maine, and also when one takes into account the cost of trucking from facilities uh, that uh, may be uh, looked at, uh, you know, uh, someone's looking at building a fair distance from a, a pulp mill, uh, then would you agree that the value of this co-generation opportunity, this uh, opportunity to uh, not have to truck those uh, residuals or possibly landfill them is, is uh, an added benefit here with this, with this bill? Um, I, I can't speak to the economics. I, I, I don't know. Um, I know that a mill is going to want to choose, my assumption is the most profitable method of getting rid of those residuals if they are not going to use them. Um, and certainly trucking is a cost. Um, landfilling, there is a tipping fee for that. So that's one of the reasons they want to avoid that. They would prefer to sell these residuals, right, rather than have to pay someone to take them. Um, but I I can't talk, I have no idea which costs more, which would be more favorable. I, I don't know. Great, thank you. Okay, seeing no other questions for DP, thank you very much, Stacey yeah. Knapp for joining me. And I'll just email you a response to those questions. I'll email Lindsay. That would be great, perfect. perfect. Yes. Lindsay's great for that. Yeah. And is there other discussion on this bill from the committee or a motion. Representative Foster. Uh, you're muted. I clicked it, it didn't go off. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I would move that we table this in the interest of giving the committee more time to analyze the uh, amended version of this bill. Thank you. Okay, it's been moved to table. Is there a second? Seconded by Representative Wadsworth. And um, for those who are visibly on the screen, uh, this does not require a senator or uh, quorum. Um, all those in favor of the tabling motion, please raise your hands. And it is unanimous of those present. All right, so LD 1202 is tabled and uh, we, Actually, I'm not sure we have a, a senator who can vote. Uh, senator Vitelli is with us by phone, and I'm not 100% sure that she's able to unmute and have her uh, voice recorded. So that might impact my decision about what bill to lay before us next. Uh, we pref always prefer that people be visibly available, uh, but I think unless Jason and Lindsay correct me that it's okay in circumstances like these to allow for a, a, vote, a, vo a vote to be recorded by voice. Senator Vitelli, can, can you hear me? I can hear you, can you hear me? We can hear you, fantastic, that's great. All okay. right. And, and now I'm going to Lindsay for, for uh, a fact check on my um, procedural assumptions there, because I, I do want to make sure that we're um, compliant with our own rules. Lindsay? I believe that she needs to be visible. Um, I, can see, I will I check on phone, that. I can see a phone icon. Does that does that count? Oh, so. I can try to sign in again on the, my phone Zoom and see if I can get an image. Oh, that's a good idea. And another thing we could do, uh, Senator Vitelli, is ask the Senate president uh, to uh, allow us to vote without a senator, knowing that you're you're actually here on the phone. It's just that you're not visibly here, if that makes sense. Okay. Yep. We did hear back. Let me try from... signing in first. Okay, great. Uh, and just an update for the committee. I did hear back from the Senate president's office. They prefer that we not vote um, until there is a senator present. So that's part of the quandary. They have the authority to um, uh, give us that privilege, but as members of the House, we uh, we can't go on without them or without their permission, as much as we might like to sometimes. Okay, so uh, we'll wait for Senator Vitelli to come back, and and um, Lindsay, just remind us the uh, the bills that we still have to work. Certainly, we have uh, LD-170, um, LD-1587, and LD-1079. Great. And I did confirm that a senator does need to be visible for a vote. Unless the Senate president allows us to vote without a senator. Very good. Okay. Can you hear me? Hey, we hear you and see you. Fantastic. The wonders of technology. <laughs> Sarah Vitelli, are you are you still without power? Yes, I am. Is there somebody I can talk to about this? I recommend that you so talk to your state senator. <laughs> I hear she's on a very I popular committee. We can address these issues. <laughs> It's the connection's a little choppy, so um, maybe what you can do, Senator Vitelli, is um, we'll do. I, I might recommend turning off your video until we get to a vote, and then turning it on just when you vote, if that makes sense. That will probably help the audio quality. There we go. Perfect. That's great. Okay. So uh, in that case, since we have a senator, this is very exciting. I, I want to go back and. Um, pick up where we left off with the supplemental budget items. Um, kind of rewind the tape a little bit, go back to supplemental budget, and we have three separate votes on our recommendations for the supplemental. So Lindsay, um, <clears throat> while, you're, while you're going back to that, um, these will be 
of votes on each item that are essentially our recommendations. Um, the, uh, the motion will be to, to move something in uh, or to move it out. And if it's moved in, we can add any uh, additional recommendation that we like. If it's moved out, we can we can specify why that's the case. If some if the motion is to move something in, that's a recommendation to include it in the supplemental budget. And the um, those voting in favor of moving it in obviously will be voting in favor of that funding, as specified by the maker of the motion. So, uh, Lindsay, what is the first item again that's in the supplemental budget? Uh, first item is Efficiency Main Trust. This is the one-time funding to support electric vehicle rebate programs, including incentive programs. This is a this is $7 million being moved over from the general fund unallocated, or excuse me, unappropriated surplus. Great. Um, and at this time, the chair would be happy to entertain a motion to, to move it in, uh, to move it in with changes, uh, or to move it out. And or to move it out with some alternative. Representative Sachs. I move that we, uh, to allow it in without changes, just allow it in. Very good, the motion is to move this item in to our recommendations to committee, seconded by Representative Kessler, any discussion? Okay, seeing none, uh, Jason, could you call the roll? Actually, I can take care of that. Okay, great. That's all right. Um, okay, uh, Senator Lawrence, absent. Senator Stewart, absent. Senator Vitelli. Yes. Uh, Representative Barry. Yes. Representative Carlo. Okay, he is absent. Uh, Representative Cuddy. Absent. Representative Foster. No. Uh, Representative Grignan. Absent. Representative Krahowski. Yes. Representative Kessler. Yes. Representative Sachs. Yes. Representative Wadsworth. No. And Representative Ziegler. Yes. Okay, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, yes. One, two, two, no, and one, two, three, four, five absent. Does that come out right? Yes, it does. Excellent. Okay, so that's six yes, two no's, and five absent. Okay, and that brings us next to uh, GEO. That and is correct. Funding for the Governor's Energy Office. We've discussed that already. Um, I did flag just for the committee's consideration that there may be some additional uh, need if the uh, land use and siting work that ACF is considering uh, is moved forward from that committee. And I would personally be very pleased if there were a recommendation from EUT to, um, to, 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 for AFA to fund that work also, if ACF is unanimous in recommending it, or if, if ACF recommends it and they can decide, you know, whether they want to take, take that up or not. Um, so a motion to move it in, a motion to move it in uh, with any, with any changes such as those I mentioned, or a motion uh, to move it out would be in order. Or a discussion. Representative Grahowski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just to clarify, um, maybe this is a question for Lindsay. Are we, uh, is it okay to, to report back? Okay, if this committee does a certain thing on a certain bill, then we want to see that in the supplemental budget. If it's not our committee, is that okay to do? I would have to, I don't know for sure. I'd have to check on that. I mean, I think we maybe we can provide a memo that says something, but that. I don't. So, I, I for me. That, um, so that our recommendations in this budget report back are just that they're recommendations, and what we will be sending AFA is a letter. That letter can can contain nuance. It can say 
you know, we, we like this idea, but we really think it ought to be one-time money, um, you know, rather than, you know, uh, put into the baseline. Um, we think you should fund this, uh, but you should add $5 to it. Um, we can say, uh, you know, if, if another bill um, comes forward that's, you know, from another committee and it requires more, you should include that as well. This is our really our one chance to, to advise AFA on the areas that, that we have expertise or oversight. So um, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Representative Wadsworth. Yeah, the chairman's correct, having served on AFA. And I'll tell you that letter from the committees is, is really helpful um, when you're trying to implement policy into something as big as a budget or, budget or a supplemental budget. So, um, you know, specific, specificity is helpful. And this just in from uh, Deirdre Schneider. I have it on her authority that uh, ACF voted today to recommend that work that we were just discussing. Um, including all personnel um, for GEO and, and, uh, and all other. Um, the vote was 10 to one with two absent. And Representative Grahowski. Um, thank you everyone for the additional feedback on how we can move forward. Um, I feel personally like I would wanna split that out into two things like vote on what was proposed and then vote separately on that funding because people might have different opinions and I don't think you know one should color the vote on the other. I don't think that provides real clarity to AFA. Yeah, so let me um, let me explain just procedurally. So if the motion were, let's say the motion is um, to move it out, right? Then uh, those voting in favor of the motion are voting to move it out, not to provide that funding. But at that time, we would then turn to those that voted against the motion and say, what is your report? And Lindsay will reflect their opinion, their, their report, if you will, on this item to AFA. So her letter will say, with respect to uh, the official state main trust, the committee voted unanimously, uh, excuse me, no, the committee, vote. Uh, these members of the committee voted uh, in favor of the 7 million for EV work. And these members of the committee voted against it. And then likewise, on this next item, there could also be a uh, difference of opinion or ideally uh, unanimity. That's always helpful to AFA. Right, Representative, right, Representative Wadsworth? Always good to have a former member of appropriations on your committee. We have friends in high places. All right, so um, if if there's interest in discussing this a little more, I realize that it's not um, a bill that the committee has looked at a lot, although we were, many of us were at the solar stakeholder group and these, uh, this bill actually comes out of, of that solar stakeholder um, uh, work that was presented by ACF and was done jointly with the GEO. So we could, talk more about that if it's helpful. Um, I think we all understand the importance of siting and land use, the challenges that our municipalities are facing um, in deciding how to how best to amend their ordinances around energy infrastructure generally. So that's really the purpose of that work. I, I see that Melissa Winnie is with us and she could probably give us an update on where things are with that or talk more about how the, um, that particular funding would be used. Representative Sachs. For purposes of the discussion, I would say not having been, I was not able to attend those hearings. I haven't looked at the, the bill. It sounds of course like a wonderful idea, but in terms of a committee recommendation, frankly, I, I, I think I could advocate for that as a member going to my AFA member but not have that as a recommendation of the committee. That's where I am with this. I would just like to see us move in or out to what we have in front of us, but without um, having had the opportunity to review that, um, that and a split vote and things like that. That is, that is not what I'm interested in spending a lot of time on this afternoon, but can respect that other people may want to do so. Yeah, and that's fine. And I do think that uh, committees do often uh, just keep it simple and either vote for or against what is put forward by the executive. 
But what I've been convinced of over my my time in the legislature is that the legislature does best when it when it looks at things um, from a bigger you know from uh, from a, from a higher level and um, remembers that that we can make recommendations policy uh, policy committees can make recommendations to AFA that are outside the scope of the executive branch proposal. So. Granted. Granted, yeah. however, saying as a committee member, this sort of last minute bringing it in, yeah. and I understand that for you, it's not last minute, but just stating that keeping it clean for me would be a, a better way to go for this particular uh, piece. Representative Sachs, um, I didn't, I wasn't addressing that to you specifically. I just, it was more of a, of a general observation and thank you for um, that response. So, the uh, the the bill that is before us, the supplemental budget, does contain a recommendation for the GEO. Um, I'd like to hear from Melissa Winnie at the GEO uh, just to get a a little more of an update on where things are and how we might proceed if we do not recommend funding for that other work. And uh, Jason, if you could bring in Melissa Winnie, that would be great. She should be on her way over. Thank you. Hello, Representative. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, so hi, Representative. Hello, committee members. My name is Melissa Winnie. I'm an energy policy advisor for the governor's energy office. Um, I think I heard your question, but it would be helpful, Representative, just if you could clarify specifically what you're asking. Um, Thank you. Um, can you just give us uh, your sense, Ms. Winnie, of where what it is that you would be required to do? Your 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 office is is overseen by this committee, and this committee only. So, I think the concern that I'm raising here is that uh, if funding for your office is being recommended by another committee, which which does not have oversight over the GEO and its budget, um, we probably owe it to you and to ourselves um, to understand what's involved in that work. So, uh, and, and maybe the committee doesn't, um, you know, have the, the, the bandwidth right now to, to really dive into that and would like to take a little more time with it. I think that's what Representative Sachs was partly suggesting. So I'm very open to that. And I guess my, my, first of all, could you, oh, okay. That is not what I'm suggesting. I'm suggesting a simple motion of ought to have in without any amendment, but I won't make that motion at the moment. But this rabbit hole is not where I believe is in the committee's best interest at the moment. Thank you, Representative Sachs. Um, Ms. Winnie, can you just give us an update on the, um, the funding that is being recommended by any other committees. Uh, today, we got a quick update from Mr. Burgess, Dr. Burgess on that. Is that still the case? Do you have any updates, any changes as of this moment? Great, thank you, Representative, for the question. And I do um, appreciate you know, some of the holistic view in terms of what is being asked of our office. Um, kind of regardless of what committee is directing that. I do think the legislation that you're referencing, LD 856, does have a lot of uh, components that cut across the work of this committee as well. Um, and it's pretty substantial what GEO is being asked to do within that legislation. So we, at a really high level, it's asking us to create a database of energy projects, including geospatial data, which I know Representative Krahowski would be excited to see 
Um, beyond that, it's also directing us to develop a plan for a pilot program related to dual use. Um, so solar sited on land that's already being used, uh, whether that's agricultural or um, other types of, of developed lands. So that's a, a big piece of work as well. And then um, it's also directing additional engagement of agricultural stakeholders in our ongoing DG stakeholder working group, um, which was directed by this committee. And so the development of that database is a, a big component. So within that, we asked for funding for a staff member. Um, and that staff member would help to develop and maintain the database. Uh, coordinate engagement with and provide technical assistance to municipalities that are considering proposals for renewable energy and support the design and establishment of that pilot project program um, plan that's outlined in the legislation. And then we also requested additional funding to help actually develop that database and provide research and other support to the other components of that work. Um, and so I was in that committee when uh, Director Burgess was here talking about the budget, so I don't know what else he provided in terms of uh, additional kind of context for us, but that is that is a, a pretty big component of work that uh, our small office would have to take on. That's very helpful. Any other questions besides mine for Ms. Winnie? All right, seeing none, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. And I would I'd be happy if the committee prefers to move forward with a vote on the underlying proposal in the supplemental, and we can always decide what, later whether to take an opinion, uh, take a, a position on the separate piece of the, of the GEO budget that would be proposed under the, the uh, work that was just discussed. So I'm hoping that that might help move us forward because I would hate to um, slow down the work that the committee needs to do. And I personally would be very pleased to vote in favor of the underlying proposal in the supplemental. And then to just hang on to our report. Lindsay, when do we need to report it back to ACF? What's our deadline? 17th. The 17th. So we do have time. Um, and I apologize, Representative Sachs, for trying to move things along, probably perhaps a little too quickly. Um, if, believe me, if this idea had uh, come to me before uh, Director Burgess was with us earlier and we were actually talking about the budget, I would have brought it up, but it did not come to me until that very moment. So that's the uh, that's how we got here and um, appreciate the, the indulgence of the committee to, to understand those budgetary ramifications if that bill passes. Um, so what's the pledge of the committee? Do I have a motion to move it in, a motion to move it out? Motion to table. I'm ready to vote to move it in personally, but uh, Representative Foster. Well, to make a motion, I'll make a motion to move it out. Okay. All right, the motion is to move it out and seconded by Representative Wadsworth. So that would be no funding. Um, and, and, and just to be clear, uh, Representative Foster, um, all of the funding that's proposed would be zeroed out entirely? Correct. Okay, thank you. Any discussion? Representative Sachs. I just wanna clarify that this funding is not from the general fund, but from federal funding for this position. Is that correct, Lindsay? That is correct based on my understanding. Um, this may be something to direct to the GEO. Let me just look at the initiatives quickly. Those were my notes that I had. So, okay. I just, so if that's the case, I, I mean, I'm completely supportive if that's how they'd like to direct those funds to these positions. So I'll be voting against the motion. The second initiative is funding from uh, United Nations Foundation Incorporated. And the first initiative it looks like this is involved in the grant. Um, just to confirm, you may want to um, double check with the GEO. OK. 
Okay, Representative Sachs, do you want to have the GEO back in just to clarify that? No, I. It's what I have on my notes. I'm I'm pretty using federal dollars for this, and I'm comfortable with that. So no need to bring in for me for anybody from the GEO. Thanks, Lindsay. Okay. Any other discussion before we go to a vote? All right, seeing none, uh, Lindsay will call the roll. Okay, so the motion is to, to have these out of the budget. So starting with Senator Lamar, and do we have quorum? Yes, I think, yes, all right, good. Um, Senator Lawrence, absent. Senator Stewart, absent. Senator Vitelli. Um, no. Uh, Representative Barry. No. Representative Carlo. Absent. Uh, Representative Cuddy. Absent. Representative Foster. Yes. Representative Grignan. Absent. Representative Krahowski. No. Uh, Representative Kessler. No. Uh, Representative Sachs. No. Uh, Representative Wadsworth. Yes. And Representative Ziegler. No. Okay, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six no's, one, two, two yeses, and five absent. So the motion fails. Okay. And um, Lindsay, in your letter to AFA, on behalf of the committee, um, as of the previous item, you'll be recording the members of the committee who voted uh, to uh, voted against the motion. And so we we voted. Uh, I'm going to ask the folks correct me if if uh, they wish to be represented differently. But I, I think the vote of no was a vote to include that recommendation uh, or to to include that item in the supplemental. So your letter will reflect that um, certain members voted in favor of inclusion and certain members voted in support of exclusion, correct? I can certainly do that. So do we need to take another or can we just, okay. All right, so we've got. That's my point. We don't, we don't need to vote it again because um, the point is just that we're all on record with our recommendations. Okay. All right. On to the next thing. And the next initiative, it's the Office of the Public Advocate. Um, this is one office specialist, one position to bring the staffing level to 10 employees as authorized by statute and provides funding for related all other costs. Okay. Is there discussion or a motion? Representative Sachs. You can tell I'm like to move on to lunch, right? Um, <laughs> I make a motion to opt in. Okay, so it's been moved in by Representative Sachs and seconded by Representative Kessler. Is there any discussion on the Office of the Public Advocate item? All right, seeing none, we'll go to a vote. Okay, uh, Senator Lawrence. Absent. Uh, Senator Stewart. Absent. Senator Vitelli. Yes. Uh, Representative Barry. Yes. Uh, Representative Carlo. Absent. Uh, Representative Cuddy. Absent. Uh, Representative Foster. Yes. Uh, Representative Grignan. Absent. Uh, Representative Krahowski. Yes. Representative Kessler. Yes. Representative Sachs. Yes. Uh, Representative Wadsworth. Yes. And Representative Ziegler. Yes. One, two, three. Eight, yes. One, two, five, absent. Excellent. Okay. Um, it is. Uh, just about lunchtime, I think, and I, I sense that folks would like to get onto lunch, but um, 
I believe that we may be um, nearing a place where we can adjourn for the day rather than having to come back. And there has been a request. I do have a request to allow for a, a, a little more time for LD170. Um, and uh, LD 1079. Similarly, we do not have the sponsor of that bill here, and I'd prefer to wait until Representative, uh, excuse me, Senator Stewart is with us to act on that bill. So that really only leaves one bill, LD 1587. And um, I am going to put that bill before the committee now in hopes that we can have a, a, a fairly quick work session on it. Um, so LD 1587, and uh, Lindsay, I don't recall if we have had an analysis on it. I don't think we need a, a long drawn out one, but um, I believe that, I feel like we, we did have at least one work session on this previously. That's correct, yes. Um, so this was, um, LD 1587 was heard on May 4th, 2021. You had a work session May 13th, and then a work session again in November. Um, so this was heard in connection um, with LD 170, and you had gone over um, kind of a comparison of how LD 170, 1587, and the initiated ballot measure, sort of the differences. I've got a chart that I can, um, I can show to the committee, although I didn't, you know, so it's sort of up to you how you'd like me to proceed. Well, I, I'll just say that I um, have been in touch with the sponsor and in light of the um, outcome of the vote in November, uh, the sponsor is fine with us moving this bill out not to pass. And reporting it out in that fashion. So um, having said that, is there any discussion or a motion on LD 1587? Representative Wadsworth. Nope, so moved on not to pass. It's been moved on not to pass. Is there a second? Seconded by Representative Foster. Any discussion? Okay. With that, we'll go to a vote. Uh, Jason? Senator Lawrence. Senator Lawrence is absent. Senator Vitelli. Yes. Senator Vitelli is a yes. Senator Stewart. Absent. Representative Barry? Yes. Representative Barry is a yes. Representative Cuddy? Not here. Representative Grahowski? Yes. Representative Grahowski is a yes. Representative Kessler? Yes. Representative Kessler is a yes. Representative Ziegler? Yes. Representative Ziegler is a yes. Representative Sachs? Yes. Representative Sachs is a yes. Representative Wadsworth? Yes. Representative Wadsworth is a yes. Representative Grignon is absent. Representative Foster? Yes. Representative Foster is a yes. Representative Carlo? Representative Carlo is absent. That is one. It's eight in favor of the motion and five absent. Okay. So Lindsay, I believe that concludes our work for today. Um, what I would like to do, and I'll, uh, we should check in with Senator Lawrence, but I, I think uh, the goal would be to try to vote as many of the bills that were tabled or not taken up today on Thursday. And that would include LD 1202, LD 170, LD 1075, and then possibly uh, just a, a a quick look at any bills that might require additional funding for any of the agencies that we oversee um, that are out there that we're aware of in the in the legislative world. And that would be in addition to the items on our list currently. So I'm sorry, what is the last item? Any bills? Yeah, before, uh, just to, to look quickly at bills we are aware of that require additional funding. We kind of began to touch on that today, uh, but bills that may have a fiscal impact that AFA could consider um, killing and moving into uh, the supplemental budget if they saw fit to do so. And that would of course require uh, 
the recommendation of this committee to make that happen. I'm not saying that we have an opinion one way or the other, but I'm saying that um, the table is typically not a good way to get something done. And if the committee does decide it wants something done, it's often better to recommend that it go into the budget and that the bill be killed. So that's that would be the goal. Um, Lindsay, we can talk offline and clarify how that should work. Thank you. Any other discussion or business to come before the committee? I'm seeing none, do I have a motion to adjourn? Moved by Representative Foster, seconded by Representative Ziegler. All those in favor? Okay, see you all tomorrow. And thanks everybody. Great job.